welcome to session session three. Um, just a quick recap. Uh, I'm not going to go through things, but um, uh, in the last session we were looking at what we can do with 3D files, and uh, we looked at Cura, of course, which was uh, a way of splitting our model um, and slicing up our model so it could be sent to a 3D printer and saving that file as a, a STL file. And we also looked at what one of my personal favorites was Slicer, which was uh, uh, a way of actually taking a model and making it so it can be cut in a laser cutter with kind of interlocking uh, pieces. Um, and I say, I think that's a really exciting free bit of software that we can use as well. Um, today, um, just before I'm going to start, on session five, I did say that we're going to do scanning, 3D scanning. There's no need for you to send things to me to be scanned because Vicky has already sent us an object, um, which is this one here, which we're going to scan um, and I'm going to film it and film the whole process, hopefully, and then edit together so I can show you the whole thing online in session five. So uh, as I say, that that would be great. And thank you, Vicky, for dropping that into us. So we're going to start now on um, a kind of drawing uh, workshop. We're going to look at two different bits of software, really. We're going to look at um, Fusion, of course, which is our kind of basic CAD system. And then we're going to look at, um, that's great, Amanda, thank you. Then we're going to look at um, Inkscape which is uh, another free bit of software as well, which I hope you've managed to download. Um, so if we start off with um, Fusion, uh, if you'd like to follow me with what we're doing, if you have any problems, if you fall behind, if you've got any questions, just um, pop it in the chat or do the hand raise thing and Owen will flag that and tell me to stop. And if you want me to repeat anything at all, just let me know and I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, so I'm gonna go and share my screen now. Okay, so. What we're going to do now is we're just going to look at simple sketching tools and I want to take a look at some of the um, constraints and ways of kind of creating construction lines. There's all sorts of things we can look at really. So we're just going to spend about 40 minutes on uh, Fusion. Uh, first thing we've got to do of course is start a new sketch and we know from last week um, all we have to do is go to the top here and this little icon on the top create sketch or we can also open the create drop down menu and create sketches the second one down so either way really we can left click on that and immediately um, fusion will give you those three axes which if you remember owen explained really well in session one uh, and they relate to the navigation box that we see right in the top right hand corner here that navigation box, I'm looking at the word top, the word front, and the word right. So really, if I select this one, it relates to the right-hand side of a model, let's say. If we look at front, this is the front. And if you look at top and bottom, this plane will be for top and bottom. So for today's um, exercise, we're drawing, uh, which we can actually send to a a machine now that machine will be a laser cutter or a um, vinyl cutter and uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to choose the top area the plane that represents the top and the bottom so we're looking straight down if I left click on that now it presents me with a piece of paper in front of me incidentally what I would I think like to do is just before we start it very quickly I know this is a bit of a pain just see if I can see and these are the machines that we have in the uh, the fab lab that run on 2d on um, from drawings basically so there's no actual profile in this have with 3d it's basically just a flatbed which will cut with a laser cutter as you can see in the first two machines here the yellow one is a more powerful laser cutter this white one here we're about to replace this is a 40 watt laser cutter next to that is the router which probably showed you last week or the week before, but just kind of you go over this again. And this router is really quite big. This is um, uh, 2440 by 1220. So 1.2 meters in width and 2.4 meters in, in, in height. So it's quite big there. We also have a lazy, uh, a water jet cutter here and a vinyl cutter. And today I think we're gonna concentrate on laser cutting. 
and the vinyl cutter as well, which I've actually got behind me here. So I'm just going to close that down for a second and come back to uh, to our blank piece of paper. Um, what I think we're going to do now is we've got our sketch. We're just going to draw some lines and we're going to dimension some lines, some circles and rectangles, actually like we did last week as well, but just getting used to it. So I think what we'll do is we'll draw um, a line from the center straight up 100 high. There's different ways we can do that. So I'm going to go to my line, which is a shortcut there. I'll go to the create menu and select line. Notice that when we move our cursor, and you notice that it's actually snapping onto the, um, the boxes. And that's because when we look at our sketch palette, which I'm sure you've all got here, it's on the left, uh, right hand side here. If we look down, if we work down here, we'll see that um, snap here is ticked. So as I'm kind of moving around and it's snapping on, just take that snap off for a second. You'll see it's a much smoother kind of movement. It's not actually linked to our page, to the grid on our page. So I'm going to put that snap back on because it's vital that it's there. So there are certain things, as you can see, that are already ticked on that sketch palette. So the first one is sketch grid, because if I turn that off, I've lost my sketch grid completely. So we need that on. The snap should stay on. I've left slice off. Show profile is there, show points, show dimensions, show constraints. All of that is switched on at the moment. And I just leave that as it's set. And what we can do is when we're coming to uh, take our um, drawing out to go to a laser cutter, Owen very kindly explained to me that we can just turn off a lot of the things that we don't want, uh, a lot of the information we don't need as well before we say, but I'll show you that in a sec. So we're going to draw that line from the centre, up the green line in the centre there, which if you remember is our Z uh, axis, and we're going to make it 100. So one way we can do it is go right to the centre here, it clicks on, hopefully, if we've got snap on, which we have. Left click and move. And notice we've got an angle that we can put in. Or we can just go straight up. Uh, now, I've got this blue box open, which is 76.52. So I can choose just to type in 100 and enter. If I absentmindedly just left click and I've made that 72 uh, high, it's not really the end of the world. I could go back and start again. Or I could just select, can you see the, um, the circle with the green tick there? I'm going to select that to say I've finished the line. But what we can do now, we know that's 70 odd high, but we can change it, we can dimension it. So what I'm going to do is go to create down here. And as we go right to the bottom there, you can see sketch dimension. So I'm going to left click on sketch dimension and then click on my line. That then, as I move my mouse, will allow me to bring forth this dimension, uh, which if I left click again, will open that box again for me. And you can see that 76.520366 in my case. So we'll just make that 100, 100. Enter, and there's our line exactly 100 high. Of course, if you want to change that, at any point, we can do exactly the same thing. But as I've already got it here, I think I could probably just click on it, maybe double click on it, and that opens it up and makes it live again. So we can make that 120 if we wish, or back to 100, 100, enter. So as you can see, we can use the mouse to click to set our, our height. We can type in. And if you get it wrong, we can just double click on it or open sketch dimension and change the dimension of what we've done there. So there's a line. OK. At that point, um, what if we don't want that to be an actual line in our drawing, but we want it to be um, almost like a construction line? On the sketch palette again, as we see over here, if I left click on my line, which made it live, and I've double clicked again. I've actually gone back to uh, put another sketch dimension. So what I'm going to do is press escape from there, out of that, and I'm back to a cursor now. If we're stuck with the wrong kind of uh, tool where the cursor is, we can just go to the top here, this blue box here where it says select, 
and that takes it back to a cursor. So I'm going to select that line, and then when it says line type in our options, the first one is construction. So I'm going to left click on it, and then click off everything. I'm just going to click in dead space now. And well, what we have now is a dotted line, which is now a construction line. But I think if I do another line, let's take another line from the bottom out. Uh, we'll make that 50. I do and enter. There you go, you're back to a line. But if I hit construction first and go the opposite way with a line, create line from the center out, you can see this is going to be a construction line. So we can decide whether our lines are going to be solid or construction lines. I'm going to control, I'm going to escape out of that actually, where we are. So that's just basically very simple kind of ways of making our kind of line in any direction um, and making sure it's the right size as well. So I'm going to take that line type and click off construction so that everything I do now will be um, a standard straight line. If I left the construction on and went to make a circle, let's go to create a circle, center diameter, and I make a circle anywhere up here. As you can see, that's still a construction line. It's not a solid line, which will make a difference. And of course, what a fantastic thing I've just realized is we can do that if we want to laser cut uh, kind of dotted lines and so on, where you want something to fold, perhaps. Um, so that's what we have. I can go back to select, select the line, and then take that construction and turn it back into a standard line there. And as you can see now, this is a closed line, as these are open lines. And so what happens is what happens inside, it goes light blue, which means now we can actually take that and extrude it into a solid. Okay. So what I think I might do now is just get rid of all of this. And what I did is I just drew a box and kind of highlighted everything. I'm just going to press delete. So we'll back out, back out now. Um, so we've got rectangles, we've got circles, we've got all sorts of different things as well. And we've got the fact that things snap on. Um, I just want to show you how cool um, the snap on kind of element is with this. Um, and to do that, I'm going to draw three circles anywhere in space. One of them is going to be in the center, perhaps, and then two circles either side of it. And we're going to make those circles, let me think. Uh, let's make them 50 millimeters in diameter. So if you want to follow me, we'll draw a, a circle. Uh, from the center, and I'll go in the center here, out here, and I'll make that. Am I on construction here? It looks like I am, so I'll just take that out. There you go. And I'll make that 50, five, zero. I can enter that now, and there's a 50 millimeter circle. I'm going to put another one in the center of that, actually, and create another one. Do exactly the same thing. And this one, I think, we'll make, let's make it 30. Then enter. We've now got two circles there. I'm going to do exactly the same thing somewhere over here. And the same thing again somewhere over there. Not too far away. If you just watch, I'm just going to do exactly the same thing now. Take my circle. We can make it smaller or larger. Let's make this one slightly larger. Let's make it 60. It doesn't matter where we start. I'm just going to type in six zero and enter. And for our shape inside that, we're going to go for six snap straight into the center there. I'm going to go for, I think, 35 and enter for a second one there. Shout out if you want me to stop and go over anything again or if you have any difficulties. Okay, it's really quite simple. We're just doing the same thing again. And then somewhere over here, let's say, we're going to do the same thing again. Uh, let's make it the same size as this one. It doesn't matter. You can make them whatever size you like, really, so long as it's not tiny or, or too big. So I'm going to create another set of circles now. Somewhere over here. Just making sure I've got snap on, which I have. Doesn't seem to be snapping on, though, for some reason. That's better. Looks a little bit happier now. 
Right, so let's just make another one here. And this one I make slightly smaller, perhaps. Let's make it 40. And of course, we'll do the same thing again. We'll put one inside the create circle. And there we'll make that one. Let's make it 25. So we know, of course, that um, I'm just using my mouse now, actually, the wheel of the mouse to go in and out, and I can kind of move the mouse this way and go in and out. So I can actually use wherever the cursor is to position these three objects. I'm going to draw some straight lines between these circles. Um, and I'm hoping that Fusion will know that I want to actually connect them up. Because most CAD systems, they'll cut the lines will overlap. Uh, they won't quite actually work in terms of uh, creating a watertight solid or a line that is completely enclosed. But the, what I really like about this is we can just go to create and align, and just by eye, it snaps on to our circle there. And I'll take it over here and snap it on to my circle over here. That's one line I've just created. The cursor is still in line mode, so I'm actually going to go over here now and bring that in to the center or somewhere around my line there. And you can see immediately that the, the central part is blue, which means that not only have I kind of like guessed where it's gonna go, but it's actually locked on to that circle, which is quite cool. Do the same thing over here and make a line to our center and another line to our center, like so. Make that fairly straight. Doesn't have to be straight though. Okay, there you have it. Again, you can see that those lines are um, shaded. So we can take this and we can elevate and um, extrude into a solid. But at the same time, we can change an awful lot of stuff on this as well. I'm not sure if you can move this one, but I'm pretty sure we'd be able to move elements of what we've just drawn. And notice I'm still in line mode, so I'm gonna go up to select there and left click. Just wondering if I could take the center there and move it. Can you see that my, it is possible to move. It's messed up the, um, the, uh, the lines completely. And it's, it's actually created a real problem there, but it's possible to move slightly. And I've still got what's happening there. I might actually just control Z out of that and go back to where it was. But it is possible to move things around and the other lines actually follow it. And I think that's, that's fairly cool. Now, what we've also got on here are the means, of course, we've just seen that we can actually change the diameters of those um, uh, those um, circles. We change the diameter or the height of that line. But if we just go on to one of these uh, dimensions, there's a 60 there, and double click on that, it opens up that field and we can make it 70. A lot bigger. We've got a lot of kind of... Um, ways of changing things around. Uh, again, I might just control Z out of that, put it back to where it was. There's an awful lot of functionality within this and a lot of um, uh, ability to move things about. I'm not quite sure if I'll be able to move this central one. No, I can't. Because if I go onto it, can you see that there's a constraint that appears here? There's two of these kind of L-shaped things. These constraints is basically telling me that um, can't really move that because there's a constraint there. I can remove the constraints if I want to. But it's interesting that there are constraints within uh, our drawing uh, tool set, let's say. And I want to look at some of those. And rather than it being a problem, we can use them to our advantage. So at the moment, I've got a line here. And I've got a line here. And notice, by the way, there's this constraint appears as well because it's actually linked to the circle. Um, I'm not sure if I can do it on here, but let's try it. I'd like this line here, the bottom, to be parallel to this line. And it may not work because I've already got constraints fixed. But if I go to, as you can see at the top here, in constraints, which is the red ones in the middle, we've got these tools here. And I just wonder if I can make my top line parallel with the bottom one. So I've got a line there, and I'm going to go to this one. And you can see it's immediately gone completely parallel 
to where the other one was. I'm going to come back to constraints in a bit, actually, and just go through them all, I think, and have a look at them and how they work. So there is a possibility, then, of using those constraints to our advantage. If I move this now, I'm not quite sure if I can grab that and move it. I'm still in constraint mode, so I'm going to go up to select there and just move my, my circle slightly out there. So as you can see, we can kind of move these around quite happily. Some of them, some of the constraints are locked, so I wouldn't be able to move this back up and down, but I know that's completely straight now from there to there. So I'm just gonna move that down if it's just slightly there. There you go. So I've done this by eye. I'm not really kind of worried too much about getting it absolutely right. Um, what I might do is see if I can move a line, just take that line and move it. And just by moving this one line, can you see what's happening? It's having an effect on everything else. And the reason it's taking the rest with it is because of these constraints that have locked it to the circle. So again, we've got that functionality as well that we can move things around to our heart's content to get that. And I'm just gonna get it so it looks near enough, like so. I think I'm probably gonna leave it at that for now for this one. Now we know, don't we, that we can select parts and we can extrude. I know this is a drawing exercise, but I think what we're gonna do now is we're gonna make a solid out of what we've got here. What I'd like to do is take our, um, our circles and produce cylinders with holes in the middle. So I don't need to produce the hole or make the hole. I could just select the circle itself and extrude that, but both ways. That's a really interesting thing. Rather than just extrude it straight up, I want to extrude it from my plane. Let's say this is my piece of paper, my plane. I could just take everything straight up, or I could choose to take it up and down at the same point. So I've got a center line right through the middle of my model, which would be very handy whenever we uh, design something. So I think what we'll do is we'll select, and I'll press Shift on my keyboard and select the next one, and Shift is stayed on, and I'll just select that one too. Now I'm going to finish my sketch. You see there's a finished sketch right on the right hand side there with a, a green tick left click on that and also with our navigation cube on the top right there next to it is a little house if you just left click on the house that will then give us that kind of thing in in a better view really rather than straight down uh, we're looking at it, it's more, more three-dimensional there is a word I'm trying to think of. Um, oh, it'll help me out, in, I'm sure, in a second. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to extrude this out both directions. We know how to do that. So we did it um, last week or the week before, and we're going to go up to extrude, either on the shortcut there, or we can open the Create menu and find extrude. Just left-click on that so we've got extrude. And what I'm looking at now is, instead of a direction being one side, I'm going to make it so it's going to be symmetric so whatever i do on one side will automatically happen on the other side as well so i'm going to left click on symmetric and now i can just go to the arrow there and either pull that up or down my heart's content really that's 10 we could make it 15 i suppose that would be okay so it says 15 there i could make it whatever i want by highlighting i could make it 18. Um, but i'm going to leave it at 15 so i'm going to go back one make that a five and now what we've done now that doesn't mean that's 15 millimeters it means that we've gone from our center 15 millimeter up so our model is actually 30 millimeters in uh, in height because it's going both ways so once we've got that we can click yes okay let's go down now um of course we've got taper angles on there as well we could put tapers on them if we wanted to um i'm just going to put an angle on there of say three and let's see what happens and it's tapering out. If you want to taper in, let's just stick a minus in front of that. And now it's tapering in slightly. Let's make it a little bit more noticeable. We'll put uh, eight. And you can see it's going in from there. That looks quite nice, actually. I think we might use that. Um, so I'm going to leave that at minus eight degrees. You can leave your straight. It doesn't matter, really. It's just to show we can do that. I know we're happy. Notice the operation is new body because it can't really do anything else. And click OK. Now, before I do anything else, we can notice that our sketch has disappeared completely. And we've got three objects. 
and they're bodies, aren't they? We've got bodies and sketches. If we go to the right hand side now, we can open up the bodies um, um, kind of file there or folder, I should say, by clicking on the little arrow next to the eye and it shows body one, body two and body three. Three separate bodies we've created, but we've also got our sketches, which we can open up by clicking on the arrow, and we've got sketch one we can make live, and there's our sketch again. So we don't have to go back into our sketch menu if we want to take those um, central parts and extrude them out either way. We're not going to go with as much as the, the, the round pieces at all, but I'm just going to highlight over them and left click on it. And as you can see, if I move my uh, box navigation box around, it's now giving me that. Now, this is interesting because I think putting the angle on might have been a problem because if I extrude this up, there's going to be a gap here. So I might have to go back actually on this uh, and sort this out because I'm not quite sure what it's going to do there. Um, so let's just see. Let's just go to it and drag that up. And it has indeed left, I think it's left it. Yes, it's left a gap there which isn't great for me. So I'm going to cancel that. Now we could start again, we could go back, but I want to point out the timeline here. We've got our sketch and we've got our extrude. Um, and you'll find the timeline right at the bottom. Go right down to the bottom and go to the left and we'll see the sketch there and we'll see the extrude. And I can go into my sketch, right click and edit my sketch and it gives me my sketch back, or I can finish that. I can go back to the extrude. I can right click on that, and I'm gonna edit that feature. Now, all I'm gonna do here is where it says taper angle, make that zero, and click okay. And there we're back to a straight sided piece that I can now join into a solid body. So if I wanted to do that taper in, I can put a chamfer on that later once we've finished it. In fact, that's exactly what we're going to do. So what we can do now, go back to our little home there. Let's do what I did before. I'm going to select that uh, central sketch, press shift on the keyboard and do the other one as well. So we've got both highlighted now. We're going to take exactly the same command, which is extrude which is here, or you can go straight to the top, shortcut there, extrude. Again, we're going to go instead of one side direction, I'm going to change that to symmetric, and we're going to take that out visually, I think. Let's see what eight looks like. Quick look at that. It's a little bit heavy, but it doesn't really matter. I think I might make that six, Let's see what it looks like. There you go, that's not bad. So we've now got our, and notice as well that the operation here is no longer new body, it's join. We can open this and see what it, we have here. We've got a new body as one of our um, uh, options, but we've also got join, which it's automatically gone to because it's predicting what it is we want to do here. So if I leave it at join and then hit OK, what's, what happens to body one, two and three? If I click OK, we now have only one body up here. If I highlight it, the entire object is highlighted as well. So we've now got our object that we've created. And the sketch is still on, as you can see. I can turn my sketch off, just leaving the object if I click off that now, so you can see the object there. Now, as we mentioned about the timeline, that's not the end of it. We can change our sketch now, and it will have a proportionate effect on the model we've just created. And this is what I love about Fusion. It's cloud-based, as we said before. Um, being cloud-based, that gives it power that another CAD system, let's say like Rhino, which is another system that we use. Um, Rhino uses the processing power of my laptop. It's on my laptop and that's what I'm using. Fusion is using the supercomputer up in the cloud and that's the difference. If I do um, uh, fillets and chamfers, which we're gonna do in a minute, on 
Rhino, it tends to kind of overload it. It's a lot of work for it to do, a lot of processing. Whereas this is instant, it's actually quite amazing how quick it is. So I'm just going to show you, we're going to go back to our original sketch and we're going to modify our sketch and then go back and see the effect it has on the object. If you want to watch this first and then do it yourself, that's fine. I'll do it twice. I'm going to go to sketch on our timeline, very first part there, right click on that and hit edit sketch. Now that I've edited the sketch, I'm going to bring that in slightly closer and I think that's all I'm going to do I'm going to finish my sketch and you can see the effect it has immediately to change the object let's do something a little bit more um, radical let's actually just change the size of this middle one here perhaps uh, we'll just change the whole size shall we go back to our sketch edit our sketch and where we have our 30 there, double click on that, and I'm going to make that 10. Enter. And we've got a tiny little hole there. Finish our sketch. Now, as you can see, that's related straight to the object. Now, it's no end to the complexity of how we can change our model. Um, we could have something with many, many different parts, lots and lots of complexity. Still go back to the very, very original sketch and everything cascades in order and changes when we should make a change to that sketch. And I think that really kind of uh, emphasizes the processing power of Fusion 360. And I absolutely love it. Um, it's a difficult thing to go from something like Rhino and then decide I'm going to have a new system. Um, but that's what we've done. And uh, I, I'd still go to Rhino for certain certain things but fusion now is our kind of main um cad system that we're working with i'm just going to change that all back to where it was edit sketch just click on that um, dimension which is actually the 10 there and just double click on that i can go back to 25. It hasn't worked oh there it is it just took a little bit of time just lagged a little bit there I'm going to finish my sketch. Right, so we know the deal here. Um, I think we'll put another few uh, lines, perhaps. I'm not sure if we will or not. Maybe we'll do a different model in a minute. But what I'd like you to do now is to put chamfers or fillets around them or put flats on them uh, on the top edges. You can make them any size you like. I'm asking you to make a start now if you remember how to do it. If you don't, don't worry. We're going to go into it. Uh, and you can follow me. I'm just going to make this a little bit smaller. I'm using the mouse. I'm actually pressing the wheel up and down to pan, if you remember, and I can zoom in and out. Uh, I'll probably go back again using the, uh, the little kind of house thing there, and I can move all the way around with uh, my mouse on the navigation box to move around there. And I'll put some, uh, some uh, fillets or chamfers on it, now, I just want to point out that in Create over here, there's a drop-down menu of everything that we need to create objects. We're not doing that. We're actually changing and modifying what you've already created. So everything we're looking for now won't be in there. It'll be in Modify. What we want in this is the fillet and the chamfer, which is one of the first. Oh, there's Press Pull as well. Um, because with Press Pull, let's do the top one here, you can take any plane, any one at all, and make it bigger. It's linked to everything else, so it's all kind of gone up that way. Or I'm going to cancel that and go back. We can even take the top part there. We can uh, modify, press pull, grab the top part there, and just make that go up. And you can see, again, because it's all linked in one body, everything's going up in the same way. Again, I'll cancel. Right, so let's go to the fillet. I want to round off certain parts, and I want to put flatted kind of chamfers on. So this one, I think we'll make uh, with a chamfer and the center one will make with a fillet and we'll do what you want on that one. So let's make a, a chamfer on this edge one here. So I'm going to go to modify and chamfer. I'm going to hit the top one here and I want the bottom to be the same. So I've also selected the bottom one and we've got this little kind of zero, zero, zero there. If we just enter five, it's put as a five millimeter. Um, chamfer on there works quite well 
We can make it smaller or we can make it larger. Um, also, the size is up here. As you can see, it says five millimeter there. I can take that out and I can make it two. And that's a lot smaller. It's also instant, that kind of reaction. Whereas with Rhino, you still have a little thing going round and round saying it's processing, you know? So let's go back and we'll make that 15 again. Now it can't do that. It's impossible uh, because I haven't got enough room to do it. So I'm going to make it eight. And it's back. I think I probably made it six last time, didn't I? So we'll make it eight and we'll leave her at that. Nice shot from there. Of course, whatever we do, if we cancel now, it will go back to a straight um, cylinder. So I have to click OK to accept that. And we're just going to put a fillet now on the outside of this one and this one. Modify. Go to fillet. Go to the top one here and the bottom one as well. And this time I'll put a smaller one. Let's put five on there and see what it looks like. It should round it off nicely. And we've got a fillet on there as well. Now, what I'm going to do now is, I think, I'm going to save this. So I'm going to accept that. Just have a look. And I've left a bit here. I've left these parts. Uh, I've left this part as well because you can come back to this later. But really, I just want to show you that we can save this because I want to look at text in a minute. We're going to start a new uh, design. Now, when I save it, of course, I can save it into, if we go to the data panel, which is right on the left-hand side, these nine boxes there, I can save it in one of my folders that are already here. And I think I already opened a new folder for um, Smart Citizens, which is here. And in Smart Citizens, I can have a new folder. So I'm going to go to new folder up there. And this is design and make anything. So I'll just call it D A M A. Um, I'll put online. This is an online course. So I know I can go to that um, and find my files. So basically, it's just open as a, a folder there. Enter that. And I can open it. Double click on it. So now when I save this object, it will be saved in that folder. So we can find it again later. So let's save it. Let's go to um, go to the top here. We can close this, by the way, now, and go. And it saves like anything else. If we go up to the file at the very top here, next to the nine kind of dot uh, squares there, drop down menu there and go to save. This is saving not on your computer, although you can choose to download on computer if you want. It's saving on the cloud again on a drive that's actually um, on the cloud itself. And I'm gonna call this Gizmo. I'll call it Gizmo 1, so there may be another one coming. Uh, and it's actually in, as you can see, the Smart Citizens folder and in the DAMA, which is Design and Make Anything Online Course. And hit Save. Just have a quick peek on the data panel. And there you can see Gizmo 1 saved. So that's now there. We can close this down or we can just choose to, like any other um, bit of software, you can see we've got a window at the top here, and we can hit that and we can cancel it, or there's a plus next to it. And uh, when you hit the plus where it says new design, we just get a new page, blank page. We can still go back to Gizmo, which is there, or we can go back to our untitled page, which I'd like you to do now. Right, so. Brand new thing. We're going to start again with a new sketch up here, create sketch. And again, I think I'll use the top panel. And rather than that, we can also click on the word top. And it's the same as clicking that, um, that bottom kind of uh, plane. So we're looking straight down on it again. Um, this time, I'm going to make a an oblong shape. And let's go to create. And we're going to go for a, am I in sketch mode here? I'm not sure if I am. Looking at these tools, I'm not in sketch mode. So what I'm going to do is create, because I can't see a sketch anywhere, so I'm going to hit create sketch. And then I'll hit that. So that, um, what I just said was incorrect. I thought I can click on the cube to select that plane to draw on, and it wasn't. It just gave me that as a um, uh, looking down on that plane. 
it didn't actually open the sketch tool. So I have to act, actually click on the thing itself. So in actual fact, um, yeah, made a bit of a mistake there. I hope I didn't confuse anyone. So we won't select um, using the box. Our page will select it from the three planes we get in the center. So this is my open um, blank page with my sketch tools. Can I just interject there? Sure. Uh, um, you can, there, there are other ways of selecting what plane you are sketching on. For example, within the browser, there's there's a tab that's called Origin. And if you open that up, um, you can see there. yeah, if you open that up, you can, and here. you can find a plane and you right click on that and you yeah. can go to create sketch that way. Yes. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you, Owen. Oh, yeah. Lovely. So we've got our sketch open and um, we're going to draw a oblong shape and that oblong shape is going to be long enough to put your name on um, so I'm going to go to create rectangle from the center because I do want to actually have it at the center there I'm not quite sure if that's going to help us when it comes to text but let's do it anyway center rectangle so I'm going to left click on there and we'll drag out and we've got two sizes and at the moment that says 260 to be honest, that's more than enough. We could make it 210, let's say, 210. Now, I've selected that, 210, and if I press Enter, that bottom bit is selected, but the top bit isn't, the height isn't. So if I press Tab on mine, obviously I'm on a PC, I'm pressing Tab, and then you can see the other one becomes highlighted. The 210 is set. There's a little padlock next to it. This tells me that that one is set. And now I'm free to put whatever I want in there. It's 70 at the moment, so I'm going to make it 60, 60. And then I'll press Enter. And that's now given me my rectangle. Notice, by the way, that we have got construction lines from corner to corner and points of reference in the center. And we've also got these kind of uh, constraints here. That's an equal constraint. That's an equal constraint. This one here, this hammer shape, is basically, if we look up here, it's perpendicular. Basically, it means it's 90 degrees, isn't it, I think? Um, so, yeah, we've got this one is equal to that one. That one is equal to this one. There's all sorts of constraints that have been automatically placed in there. We can ignore them for now. What we're going to do is we're going to draw some text. And we can draw some text anywhere and move it, I think. But um, I'm going to try and draw the text roughly in the center. So to create up here, as we go down, we can see about three quarters or two thirds of the way down here, the word text. Now, I'm not used to um, using text in Fusion. So I'm going to left click on it and I can see I've got a cursor. And I think rather than just click it, I think we have to draw a box on here. Yeah. So I'm drawing my box inside the box that I've created originally. And now we have sample text. And it has to appear in the top right, which is always a bit of a pain for me. But it doesn't matter because we can move it in a minute. So now we can actually type in what we want to say. As you can see, it says text, sample text. And I think sample text will stay there if I stop writing my name. Oh, no, it doesn't. There's my name, Ian. So second name, Hanky, H-A-N-K-E-Y. Right. Or we can use capitals. Um, I don't think it matters that much. But I think that's a little bit small. And I'd like to make it bold as well. So as you can see with typeface, we can change from Arial. And we've got all of these to choose from. And, of course, it shows you them as well, like it does in Word, which is so nice for a change because normally you just get them and you don't see what they look like. We're going to keep this fairly simple, though. If you get something that's very complex, has lots of swirls in it and stuff like that, it does create problems that CAD solid models may actually find a bit tricky. So I'm just going to leave it as my name. Uh, leave it as Arial for me. I'm going to make it bold. And the height at the moment is 10. And I can see that's 10 there. So I'm going to make it 30 and see if that's too big. So my height here, which is 10, I'm just going to type in 30. And it's a little bit too big there. I can move things around, of course, but I'm going to make it 25. So instead of 30, make it 25 there. And again, let's make it 20 and see what happens. 
and there it is in the center quite nicely. It's not dead straight, and I can move it around, and there will be constraints in there so that I can um, highlight them and move them and so on. But all I'm going to do, I think, is let's see what we've got. We've got flips in here as well, so we could, if we wanted to flip it that way. I don't want to do that. I'm going to go back. And we've got alignment here as well, align left. Uh, we've got a line center, so I just put it centered there. And there's a line middle, so I can hit that as well. So it's now aligned within, not the outside box, but within the inside box I kind of drew. So you've got the ability to move things around within before we actually click OK. And we can move it afterwards as well. Um, so I think I'm quite happy with that. So I'm going to click OK. And I've got my text. Now, the thing to remember about text is that it's not actually in CAD, in a lot of CAD systems, it's not what we call a vector line. As you know, with our kind of lines that we draw in CAD, our laser cutter will follow it, and it's absolutely fine. But with text, and it's the same with Inkscape, we're going to look after break as well, it doesn't recognize it. It's actually a PDF. It's almost like you in CAD you can type things and it will be printed, but it won't actually go to a machine. So what we have to do here is highlight that text and then create a vector line from it. And that's actually the same in Illustrator as well. If you want to try and get text to be shown up in a machine, you need to find the outlines. Can't quite remember how to do this. So I'm going to make sure I'm on select and I'm going to select my name. And there it is selected. If I right click now, I'm hoping, here we go, we've got some functionality. And the third one down here is explode text. If I left click on explode text, lo and behold, we now have vector lines. That's really quite important. Um, if we don't do that, we send our things to the machine, everything's there except for the text. And it's generally because we've forgotten to create a vector around it. So would anyone like me to go over that one more time? Obviously, we've recorded it as well, and you can watch back. But I'm happy to do that a second time if you want me to. Yes, please. OK, so I'm going to control Z back. And I've got my text now that I've just typed. Um, I'm also going to type something at the top here so we can do it from scratch. Um, I'm going to go to Create. I'll go to Text. I'll draw a box up here, and there's sample text on there, and I can change my sizes. I'll make it back to 10, actually, There's sample text there. I can make changes there and just click OK when I'm ready. Um, it's not allowing me to click OK there, so maybe I'll just enter. It's not allowing me to do that. I wonder why that is the case. Ah, right. It's already there. Let's try that one more time. I'm not quite sure what I did wrong there. So create, text, make a box there. There's sample text. Uh, and it's not allowing me to OK there. I'm not quite sure why. So, ah, because I've still got sample text. Let's make Ian. Just write Ian in there. Now I can OK it and I can change it and so on. So it's just me being an idiot there. Sorry about that. Uh, so we can take it off bold, put it back on bold, click OK, and we've got our text written down. We can click on this text, so just hover over it until it goes dark blue there, then right click, and we hit Explode Text. And there it is, no longer a PDF or no longer just text for um, explaining information on our technical drawings, on our, our CAD drawings but it's now a vector in itself. It's something that we can create into a solid. I'll do the same thing for my name down here. Highlight it, right click, hit explode text, and it now becomes a vector line. So lots of different things we can do here. Um, notice I can highlight everything except for my name. So uh, I'm just going to go down now and zoom in and notice the middle part here. I can press shift and highlight the center parts. I think I just highlighted a point instead there. It's important to think about these center parts. I'll go in a bit more. Okay, so what I can do here, of course, 
is I can uh, finish my sketch. Put a little house there. And we can extrude that up and down. Let's do that. Let's go to extrude. And I'll just extrude down. Click OK. And we've got a new body there. And it's got my name cut out of it. Like so. Notice, by the way, if we wanted to make this, we'd be in a bit of trouble, wouldn't we? And this is really important to think about. That as we look straight down, it all looks great. But if we do a laser cut, okay, and we look at the bodies we've got here, we'll open them up. We've got body one, two, three, four. We've got different bodies because we can hide the center of the A, the center of the A over there, and the center of the E. Because let's face it, they're just going to fall out. Let's put them back. And as you move it around, you can see that they would just, they're just separate pieces that will fall out. So what we want to do is something a little bit more um, uh, complex, let's say. I'm going to, I wonder if I can just control Z back out. That is a little bit daft, so I can just hide them really and go back. But I'm just going to control Z back. It's a little bit too much though from all I've done there. Ah, there you go, I'm back in sketch mode. I'm probably going to highlight that, and I'm just pressing delete on my um, keyboard to get rid of it. So a better way of doing this, I think, is to take our solid and make it into an object. And then we can decide what we're going to do with the name part of it. So what we're going to do is going to highlight everything first. Um, highlight the text, perhaps, and raise that up. Then highlight the, um, or raise it in both directions, so it goes up and down, that would be better. And then we can highlight the rectangle and just take that downwards. So let's do exactly that. I'm going to just hover, I'm going to zoom in a little bit over my name. So I'm going to into the centre and you can see that it kind of allows me to left click and make it blue. Same thing with the A and the same thing with the A. To be careful, I don't want to highlight a line. I want to highlight the whole thing. And again, I'm going to press down on my wheel and move across. And then I can highlight the rest of the text. Like so. Now, with this name, we're going to extrude, if you remember, but both ways. And so we'll probably have to finish our sketch. And I think we can do that and it'll stay highlighted. And I can hit that little kind of uh, house to put it there. And we're going to extrude, but in two, dire to two directions. So instead of one side, we're going to make it symmetric. And we're going to type in, let's type in 10 and see what it looks like. There's 10. Maybe make it a little bit smaller, actually. Let's make it 5. So the whole thing is 10. That's not quite enough. So I'm going to make it somewhere in the middle. Let's make it 8. Whatever you like, really. But I'm going to make it eight. That's fine. So if I create a new body, I'm pretty sure I'll have a body for every single one of those uh, those letters. Let's hit OK. And there uh, is my name in solids, which we can 3D print, of course. What I want to do really is hide these. The reason I'm hiding it is... Um, I think, I'm not sure if we need to hide it, actually, because we just need to take that um, whole kind of plane and drop that down. So let's open our sketches. Sketch one, and there it is. I want to take everything, but when we highlight it, all the uh, letters and everything are kind of in the way, don't you think? So I can hide the bodies, all of them. Instead of going through them all, the top one there, if we hit that little I, our bodies disappear. They're still there, they're just hidden. And at that point, I can then go through and I can highlight the rest of it, because I want to get all of it. So I'm going to shift, shift, and the center part as well, because I want everything. I get to the end there, and I'll press down on the wheel and move to the left, and then get the rest of my... So just pressing shift and hit as we go along. 
like so. That selected the whole plane. And we're going to take that plane down now. And let's take it down, uh, let's see, about 25, 30, something like that. So I'm going to go to extrude. I'm going to go drop that down. And of course, you can't see it because I turned the bodies off. We can turn the bodies back on again here. And now we can see that it's going up and down. And it's a cut. It wants to cut. I don't want it to cut at the moment. I can get it to, but I'm not going to. I'm going to go to operation. And it's important we go to new body here. So I'm going to hit new body. Okay. So what that means is each one of my letters is a body, but I've also got a new body, which is the base that we've got here. So I'm going to click OK. If we click join, it will just be one body. We won't be able to do anything with it. So new body, click OK. So now I think it'll be body 10 will be the large one there. I'm going to call that one base. So I've just double clicked on it, type in base, A F E rather than double S. Okay, so what I want to do now, I think, is we could join all these together so that we have a solid with my name. I mean, that's really easy. Uh, we combine. Uh, I think I can just click body one and the base as well, the shift, and they'll all highlight. And again, it will be a modify up here. We can go to combine, and there it is, combine. And it will join everything into just one body, and that could be 3D printed. I'm not actually going to do that. I'm going to cancel. Because what I like to do, really, is use the text to cut into the base. It'll probably be, uh, it might be combined, but it, we're actually cutting into a body. Not quite sure how to do this, and I'm going to, I'm going to apologize right now, but I would imagine it's something like combine. Uh, I've got my base here, which I can highlight, and I've got all the others I can highlight as well. So I'm going to go to modify and see what I've got to choose from. And I can see split body straight away, but that might have to be using a profile, play, face, or plane. I'm not quite sure if it's going to work with solid. Let's have a look at combine and see what we've got. Uh, it performs Boolean operations between solid bodies. And I think combine might be the one that we need um, rather than split body. So I'm going to hit combine and hope that I can figure out a way of actually making it cut rather than join. So I'll hit combine there. And the operation is join. There's a target body and tool body. So the target body is definitely the base. Okay, the tool bodies will be everything else. So I'm going to hit the base there, and it's asking me for the tool bodies. And it's the operation at the moment is join. If I hit one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, and nine, these are now my tool bodies. And instead of join, I'm going to go to cut. And I can see straight away it knows what I want to do because it's turned it red. I'm going to hit OK. Oh, by the way, it says new components and keep tools. So I can choose to keep the text, to cut into it, but keep the text so that I can actually bring it in and hide it and have the holes. I'm not going to keep the tools, though. I'm just going to click OK, and we can see what we've got now is a solid with the letters cut out of the solid. You can't see it very well, but if I turn around there, we've also got all our um, um, sketch tools on as well. Um, let me just see what we've got here in time we've got. Okay, um, let me kind of zoom out. Let's look at what we've got here in terms of bodies. We've got one body here that we can turn on and off. There. We've also got our sketches that we can turn on and off, and you can see the sketch there. And of course, as Owen mentioned before, we can put the origin back on, and I've just turned that ori origin off. So what we're left now is just this model that we've created. And of course, we can send that to our um, uh, 3D printer and save it as an STL. Or we can send it to a laser cutter or any of our 2D machines. We also have a vinyl cutter, which I'm going to show you in a, in a while. Um, so we could save it as a solid if it's going to go to uh, um, a 3D printer or as a drawing 
if we want it to go to a laser cutter, vinyl cutter, etc. So I'm going to do both of those now. We did this last week anyway. There's no harm in doing it one more time. I'm just going to go to the base, right click there and save as STL. Finally, make sure it's high there. Click OK. I'm going to put name uh, base. Say STL. It's going on the desktop there. I'm going to hit save. While we're at it, of course, um, it's untitled still. So we could actually go up to file up here and we can give it, go to save, we'll give it a name and put nameplate. Nameplate, like so. And hit save. And now when we look at the nine kind of boxes in the top left though, we can see we've got two files saved. We've got our gizmo. And we've got our nameplate next to it. But of course, we're looking at sketches rather than solids now. So I'm going to turn the, the body off and turn the sketch on. And there's our sketch that we can send to a laser cutter or to a, uh, 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 a water jet cutter or whatever. But we've also got the line in the middle. Sorry, we've got the dot in the middle. And we've got these kind of uh, construction lines as well. It's probably worth going back to our original sketch down here. Right click and edit our sketch. And as Owen quite rightly pointed out, when I was moaning about all of the kind of constraints and marks and stuff that were coming out as I was saving my files, um, he said, well, why don't you just turn them off? And of course we can do that in our sketch palette. Whatever we turn off now though, I'm gonna turn back on again for the next time I do drawing because I'm gonna need them. And we can see um, from the base here, we can see show constraints, which is the third one from the top. Now, these are the constraints, these marks here, which will actually be exported out as well. So I'm gonna click off that one, and you can see they've disappeared. The one up is show dimensions. Click that, or click off that, and they've disappeared as well. Show points, and the points have gone show profile i'm not quite sure where the profile is but i'll take that off as well and show projected geometries there take that off as well we still got our construction lines there which i'm not quite sure about um so maybe we'll just have to take that out but i can also i think grab that i could probably delete it to be honest um broadcast our, our um dimensions come back on there so that's kind of a cleaned up or partially cleaned up um, file that we can take out. Let's do just that. I'm going to go to my sketch, right click and save as DXF. Left click on that. And I will call this uh, again, nameplate. It's been saved as a sketch. DXF. I'm going to put it onto the desktop, desktop again and click save. And there we have it. Okay. Interesting to see what comes in when we go into the laser cutter. And I think I'm going to do that now to see if these actually come out. So I'm going to open up RD Works, which we'll be opening up quite often actually in this session. And of course, this is the software. Remember CAD CAM? Term CAD CAM. Uh, we think we know that um, CAD is computer design and CAM is computer modeling. And in this case, it's the uh, it's a laser cutter that we're using. That's our cam. I'm just going to bring in the file that I've just saved. File and import. And we're going to go up to our desktop. Awful lot of things there. I'm sorry. And we should find our DXF. not quite sure oh there it is nameplate dxf and of course we've got that cross line there not a major problem because what we can do once it's in is just highlight that line and hope it say in a cap there you go just highlighted it and hit delete highlight quite sure why it won't let me highlight it there you go highlighted it there hit delete and there we have now our um nameplate that we can choose to cut out or engrave. Now, I wouldn't cut everything out because as we know, the middles of the A's are gonna actually 
fall out if we cut it all. So what we'll probably do is um, engrave the centre part and cut the outside part. So I need to change the colours to give it a different setting. So I'm going to do that now. Go into mm -hmm. Ian Hagidar and give it a light blue, a dark blue. So I've got two um, colours and two lines of information here. We're going to come back into that later. But I just wanted to see if that the construction lines came into our software at this point. Let's go back into Fusion now. I don't want to confuse things by staying in this. We'll come back into this in a little bit, in a little while. Just checking time. We've got 20 minutes before we have a break, if everyone's okay with that. Let's just go back to Fusion now. Okay, I just want to have a look at some more of these constraints at the top. And to do that, I think I'm probably, I can close this one down, of course. Um, because I've got it saved. That's the other one we had, which is Gizmo 1. Just close that. Um, I'm going to open a new page, a new design, which is not the cross, but the plus next to it. I've got a new page there. And again, I could probably get rid of a nameplate, but I'll leave it open for now. Uh, what we're going to do now is just make some very quick sketches and then see how the align tools, or rather the constraint tools work. I don't use them all, I've got to say, but if we just work through them, some of the basic ones, we'll understand how they work and how they can help us when we come to uh, drawing. Now remember, we kind of drew something very roughly and then we had the opportunity to move things around and we could re um, rescale things as well. And that's another thing I want to do before um, break, is to bring in a drawing a photograph, I should say, and then make that photograph the scale that we need it to be. Sounds a bit confusing, but let's start one step at a time with a new sketch. And I'm going to select the bottom again. Okay, so I'm going to draw, I think, a circle in the center. We can make any shape you want, by the way. Just feel free to make what you want. I'll make that one 100. Uh, I'm going to draw some lines now, just any old line. Um, we can go to create, and we've got line. I'm going to go to the top there, and I can actually take it out anywhere, uh, anywhere that way, anywhere back. I might actually go back to this point, I'm not quite sure, and another one on the other side. I'm going to start over here. Not sure if this should be the same. Play there. And we can make some other shapes as well. Let's do just that. Let's um, make a kind of a. And it will snap back into place as well over there. Let's make another shape over here. And back. About. Let's put a few circles in as well. I think that's probably enough to start with. Um, there's a couple of constraints on there, but not too many. Um, let's have a look at, I hope, I hope you don't mind me going so quick on that. Uh, you know, you, you can make any shapes you want. You don't necessarily need to uh, have loads of them. It's more of a demonstration bit, this anyway. And I'm learning here. Um, what I think I'd like to do is look at, we know we can make the top one. I'm already in a sketch mode, by the way, so I'm gonna go to select here. So I've got the cursor. Um, we can make this um, equal to that. We can make it in terms of um, making it parallel. We can also make them equal. So at the moment, I've got one line, which is a lot longer than that line. So you can see this one here is parallel, but we've got one there that says equal that's next to it. So I'm going to use that equal. I'm going to hit the top one first, and then I'm going to hit the bottom one. And what it's done is it's made the two lines equal and then moved everything to suit. That's fine. And I can also do the same with the two ends. Let's, I've still got the equal, as you can see, um, icon on my cursor. So I don't have to go to select because it's still live. I can hit this one and then go to the other one over here. And that's made those equal. So what we can do now, I've got constraints already on that. They've already been made equal. If you want to, we can actually make them 90 degrees as well. 
not quite sure how to, but I'm just going to go now to this one where it says perpendicular. And I think I'll probably hit this line and then that line. And you can see now this is 90 degrees. But because I've made everything equal, everything else has become 90 degrees as well. So that's fine. Um, in terms of parallel, I think everything will be parallel with itself. If I had the line at the bottom here, I could probably make that one parallel with it. Let's just see if we can do that. Go to create and align. And I'm just going to make sure my line is there. Click OK there. And I think, I'm not quite sure which way around it is. So we'll find out. I'm going to go to select. I'll go to the parallel one there. I'll hit the first one and the second. And if the second one goes, no, that's fine. It's actually then made this completely parallel with our axis at the bottom there. So that's the first thing we can look at. Not necessarily need that. So what we can do here is we can um, do the same thing on this one. But I think with this one, I think we'll make one of those corners 90 degrees. And then we'll actually scale one of the, um, the lines coming from it. So let's go to the perpendicular. And I think we'll hit this one and then that one. And you can see we've now got a 90 degree um, angle there. If we go to select and we take this bottom one here, highlight it, and then go to create and down the bottom here, we've got sketch dimension and hit sketch dimension. We've now got the ability to click on that and type in, at the moment it's 932, is that? So let's make it for 600. Enter. And now we've got 600 going out from the bottom. Um, we've got angles as well we can use. I'm not going to go into that right now because I'm just looking at constraints. Um, I'm not going to go and get confusing. Um, what I'd like to do, I think, is make the 600 at the bottom uh, the same as the line at the top. So we can equal them. So if I go to equal the top there, I'm going to hit the bottom one and hit the top one. The top one becomes equal with the bottom, and then we're back to a boring rectangle. But you can see my points that we can use these uh, constraints to our benefit here. Um, this one here is a midpoint. So if I want to find where the midpoint is, if I hit midpoint there, hit this line here, I'm hoping I would get something there, but perhaps I'll have to draw something to go to the midpoint. Um, so I'll draw a line, I think. Let's just select out of that. I wasn't quite sure how that was going to work, so I'll just draw a straight line. Ah, there it is. It did actually put it in, because if I go to this line and travel along, eventually a triangle appears. There it is. And that shows me that that is the midpoint of my, and it, there's another triangle at the bottom there of my lines. And there's a new constraint that has appeared here, which is the triangle that was over there. So the midpoint did actually work. I was just expecting it to put that there um, at the beginning. Uh, so finds a midpoint anywhere, of course, as we're working when I've got that, um, that tool. Let's have a look at um, this one, concentric. This is really handy, actually. I go to concentric there, I'll hit this circle, I'll go over and hit that circle, and it puts it right in the middle. So it's a means of actually centering things. It's a little bit like the alignment thing we had earlier on, isn't it? So what I want you to do now is just spend a few minutes and play with this one, if you've got one like that, or construct something. And just go through some of these um, constraints. Uh, this is horizontal vertical. So if I have a line, let's do that, and just finish it, okay? And I hit that line, I'll probably have to go to select, to select it, go to the horizontal vert vertical there, and it makes it closer to the nearest one it is. If I went up that way slightly, it would have made it vertical. So it's just a very quick means of getting that accurate. The next one, of course, is the coincidence. Not quite sure about the coincidence in the tangent, but I think I could put a circle on that and it will put it on a tangent. Let's just do that. Circle. 
put it near it, let's say. Go to the tangent there. I'll probably have to click one and then the other. And there it is, placing the tangents as so. So you can work your way through them. I don't use them a lot, I have to say. The ones I use are the kind of equals, the perpendicular, and the, the, um, the concentric, and of course that midpoint. It's really important because if you draw an object, a square, and you want to find the middle of it, it's really handy. You've got a midpoint to go straight down, midpoint to go straight down that way. Um, it's just very, very handy, basically. So hopefully that hasn't kind of confuse you too much. I must say, when I started using Fusion, the constraint and the sketch palette did my head in, in terms of trying to understand it. Um, and I think this playful approach to going through them and seeing what they do is actually really quite a nice thing to do um, and get used to. So hopefully you've all been playing a little bit as I've been rabbiting on. Um, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left, I think. And in that time, I want to show you another really useful uh, method that we can incorporate into Fusion for design. Um, just going to kind of see if I can equal this one to that one. Uh, equal, go to that one, hit that one there. And I can see it hasn't done much, but I can see there's an equal sign there, an equal sign there. Um, so, yeah, we, we can kind of play around that's our heart's content. Um, you can play with that for a while. And as I say, we've gone through most of them now. We've got parallel, perpendicular. Fix and unfix I've not used before. So I would imagine that when you're happy with it, we can just hit fix. Um, midpoints there, concentrics there. Collinear, I'm not quite sure, so I'm just going to have a look. Constraints, two more objects, so they share a common line. Okay, Don't use it much. And there's symmetry as well. So I think on one side, anything you do on one side will appear on the other side as well. Again, not quite kind of familiar with those. And they are a little bit advanced, as I say. But I think that's covered roughly the, the constraints or the basic constraints that we have. So I'm going to finish my sketch. I don't necessarily need to keep this. Uh, and I'm just going to open a new page. And I want to show you how we can bring in a photograph of something and then make that photograph the right scale for us to be able to draw a design around it. And this is a demonstration only, but you can obviously bring anything you like in there. I'm going to go to insert up here. Um, and it's allowing me to insert from obviously my project uh, on the cloud, but also insert from my computer. So I've just clicked on that, I've gone to my desktop there, and I'm looking for a particular, um, and forgive me, I'm a glass blower, so I'm going to choose this Venetian wine glass here and open that up. Now, the image that I've selected is up here, the JPEG, but it's asking me what face I want to put it on. And of course, when it says front there, I'm going to put it on the front face because it's the photograph is it front on, and you'll see that in a second. So I'm going to select that. And the size of it is quite small at the moment, but I'm not too worried about the size. As I move around, I can see this. I can stretch this in different ways, but I think there's a, a curve here. I can stretch outwards and it will stretch my, my, my photograph. But if we go to this little curve at the top there, we can make our, and you can see the object there. So I'm gonna make it about that big so I can see what I'm doing. I can actually make it even bigger. And again, it's that little curve that we're kind of working with. Right, so this is my um, photograph. Before I click OK, notice that it's brought it in with a canvas opacity of 50%. So I could make it 100%. We can see that photograph, we can't see through it. I can make it really light so we can hardly see it. So 50% is actually quite nice. It allows us to see our, our image, but it also allows us to draw and see our drawings as well. So at that point, I'm going to say, OK, I'm happy with that. It's 46% canvas opacity. It's about 50. That's fine. I'm going to click OK there. Now, what I've got is a photograph that has no scale. I don't know how big it is. But let's say that looking at scale wise, looking at this, around about 200 millimeters high is what I want this to be. So I'm going to draw it, create it in CAD, create some technical drawings from it. Um, and then from that, I can probably go and make it in, in the glassworks, I'd say. 
But in order to do that, I need to calibrate my drawing. And to calibrate it, I'm gonna have to guess that this foot here, if it was completely flat, would be through the center of this, this oval. It would be this way, and the top of it is flat there. So from that point there to about here, I'm gonna make this 200 millimeters high. Once my uh, image is the right scale, I can draw around it and create that object. Let's do just that. I'm gonna to go to the image, um, which is a canvas up here, highlight it. Then I'm gonna to go to create, oh, I think we can right click actually. And there we have it. The third one down is calibrate. Just there, I'm gonna left click. And now I've got this plus. So I can go on the top here between the oval that's there to see that would be my height and then down here is my second one about there and it's not far out actually it says 232.169959 i was going to make that um i think we said about let's say about 200 let's make it 200 hit okay and i've scaled my drawing now exactly to 200 in terms of that size and then if we want to now, I'm very, very quickly, we're going to go a few minutes before break. I'm going to go to a new sketch. I'm going to select the back there. And I'm simply going to draw, I can draw all of it. I'm just going to draw one element of it. And of course, it's in the center, which is nice. <laughs> I'm going to create a line uh, from, let's zoom right the way in here, from the bottom about there to the top about here somewhere in the center, there. And then I'm gonna go right out to the side, to about there. I'm gonna click OK there. So I'm gonna put a curve line on this part here to join it up. So I'm gonna to go to Create, I'm gonna to go to Spline, if you remember, which is the curve, Fit Point Spline, hit the top there. And I don't need many of these curves, really. The less of them there are, the more, um, uh, the better the line is going to be. And I'm going to bring it to the, and then that's oh, gone a bit too far. So I'm going to control Z out. I think I can go to, it's going to go to a bit of a point though. So perhaps the, and then to the end. And click OK. And I can change these points, of course, that I put in here. Um, I'm going to go back to select and zoom in. And I've got points and I've got these things that I can turn as well. So that point there I can drag out just to check this about, and that's okay, that's fine. So at that point, I can turn my sketch off, or rather my uh, Venetian glass off, and of course we've got this, which we know we can go to finish our sketch, go to revolve, and the axis of revolve around is this one, and click okay, and then I'm gonna skim or skim to uh, hollow this out so i'm going to go to uh, modify shell hit the top there and make it one millimeter thickness now i can also do this and draw the thickness in so i can draw two lines that are thick at the bottom going thin at the top and i've got that somewhere actually um so that's kind of a cheating way of doing it so i'm going to click okay there and of course what i've got now is something that i can very quickly let's go and render it let's go from design into render i briefly mentioned this and we'll go into render in more depth actually in session five which is scanning and um mesh mixer uh, in, in terms of what we can do with scans and we'll put materials onto them and so on i'm just quickly gonna put an appearance there which is the first one and find some glass which is there you don't have to worry about this because we are going to do it later it is glass at the moment, but it's really dark. So the next thing I'm going to do is close that and go to the scene settings there and just give it a little bit more so you can see through it. And there we have it. I'm going to click OK there, close. Go back to my design. And there's my kind of rough kind of glass thing there. But I've also got my canvas. You can turn back on. Go to the front there. And I can see the start of my design with my three-dimensional object on there. And I think that is a perfect time for us to stop for a break. Now, as I said, this is just a kind of quick um, demonstration. Um, 
but the idea of calibrating a photograph that can come in you can photograph anything or take a photograph of uh, anything or just get an image online or whatever bring it in you can design around those um those dimensions or the aesthetics of that so um maybe to break this up a little bit um because we've been looking at um our laptops our computers um so far i really enjoyed the fact that we could show you a 3d printer um last week and uh, problematic as it was we did actually get it to print and um i want to show you um i can't bring the laser cutter to you but i've made a film of how the laser cutter works and how to set it up and focus it and so on and i'll show that a little later but um i've got this vinyl cutter with me i can't really see it very much i'm going to bring it as close as possible and i'm going to bring you to it and so on So I'm hoping if I move this up, you can actually see machine this long. Um, it's got some vinyl in there already. It's just sticky back uh, vinyl. It's the kind of thing that you would get um, if you want to make a, a sign or something for the side of a van or on a window or something like that. And it's really good uh, long wearing. You know, it'll be outside and it'll be fine in weather and so on. So um quite an interesting process um it's rather like laser cutting but instead of a bed a square bed that we've got where you've got an axis that goes um x-axis that goes this way and a y-axis that goes up and down on the bed um this actually just has one axis that goes side to side let's say our x axis or it's a y-axis on this actually going side to side and that's because we're looking at it at a slight angle as it goes through um, we've also got another axis, but instead of this, because it's quite a long machine, instead of having an axis that goes forwards and backwards, let's say, it will actually, with a couple of wheels on there, move the material forwards and backwards. So, at the moment, I've got it here, I can press one of these arrows here, I'm hoping you'll see it come out. You see it get longer there? We can take it back up again. A little bit more. So between the wheels that push the material forwards and backwards and the motor that moves side to side, we've got an X and a Y axis that we can actually cut. Um, with a laser cutter, of course, we've got a, a laser beam that's fired and it hits a mirror, 45 degrees. Let's do this, actually. So 45 degree mirror, um, that way. The laser is fired this way, hits the mirror, and it goes straight up this way. Hits another one here, and it goes that way. Hits another one as it's traveling along, and it goes down. And that's pretty much how the laser cutter is gonna work. It, it cuts through material with a, um, with a laser beam. This has got a scalpel blade, if you imagine, which is at this point here. And what it will do is as the material goes forwards and backwards, and this actually goes up and down and then slices where it sees a line, it will actually drag a line which will cut into the, um, the vinyl. It's really quite simple, right? quite easy to use. Too complicated, I think, for me to actually try and get a file on Fusion and then export it out and then take it to this and so on. So just for ease of use, I'm gonna show you, I hope, if I take this and bring it down, hoping I can show you a little bit crazy showing a screen from a screen but you can probably just about make out that on my screen I've got a flat sheet and I can import my design onto that sheet and just as we saw with RD works we had a kind of a an idea of the bed size this sheet here represents what we can put onto that machine and we can just bring a, a file onto it and with the term CAD CAM, CAD is your design, CAM is a machine. This is the software that will accept your design, translate it into information the machine understands, and then send it to the machine. You can't actually see this. Um, in fact, if I do that, you can see it. I've just realized I can kind of wake it up a little bit. Um, so I've got functionality in there, and you can see the grid here, which we're going to put something on. Instead of actually designing something to put on there, down here I've got a palette of shapes 
that I can just drag onto this that are already in the software. So I'm just going to bring an arrow in. Um, I'm just going to go over here, grab a shape, and drag it. I'm going to have to do that with a mouse, unfortunately. Let's see if this works. It would help if the mouse was plugged in. Welcome to the world of CAD. Wonderful. <laughs> I thought you'd appreciate that. So um, all I'm doing now, you can't really see it on here, but I'm just going to go over the kind of standard kind of shape and drag one onto my uh, desktop there. And I can make it a bit bigger. And can you see, I don't, you can't see it, but there is an arrow now on there that I've just brought in onto my, you can't, it's very difficult to see, but if I just click off it, there is a very faint arrow on there, I can assure you. So, so that's my design. And of course we can bring our design, save it and bring it onto here. And we, this actually accepts Illustrator files. So we can convert files from DXFs into Illustrator files. And I'm gonna show you Inkscape in a minute, which also does the same thing, I think. So I'm gonna put that computer back up, oh, laptop back up here. Now, along with any piece of kit that we've got, it's all very well sending something to the machine. But we need to define an origin point. And that's a point where we can actually move it physically uh, to say, I want you to start at this point and then do the arrow from that point. So that's what I'm going to do now, actually. Um, I'm going to move my material forwards and backwards. I'm also going to move this in a little bit. So you can see it. Okay, so I'm just going to use this arrow here to bring the material back in. Just a bit more, so I'm not wasting material. Now the um, the actual scalpel blade is where my finger is here, so I need to move this across into the corner because I want to start here and then just make the arrow shape uh, and cut into the vinyl. So I'm going to move across. This is what it is, and it's just moving across now. Gone a little bit too far there. I'll bring it back a bit. So this point here is where it's going to start on the um, on the um, the arrow. Hopefully, move that out of the way a little bit. Sorry about the wires. So I'm just going to go to my um, laptop now, and like everything else, once my my design is on the machine, once my machine is set up with an origin point, I need to actually press a target in the center there and it tells me X is zero, Y is zero. It's telling me that that is now set as the origin point. So what I'm gonna do now is take it and put it online. It now says online. And because of that, it's now connected to the laptop. So if I press send, I'm hoping that that will send information to the machine. The machine will simply cut out our shape. Let's see if it does. Go to cutter, cut, and just hit cut. Off it goes. And it's finished. That's done. So let's have a look at what it's done. I'm going to take it back offline. Bring everything forward slightly. Okay, and I'm going to cut a bit of this out just so we can actually see it. Bit of a waste of material, I know, but it's a great demonstration. Right, so the idea of this is the vinyl is incredibly sticky. Let's actually push this back. And the arrow has been scored onto this. I can either remove the arrow 
or I can remove the outside part, leaving the arrow. And it'd probably be a good idea to try that, to remove the outside part. So I'm just going to prise the thing apart here, I think, if this works. Of course, you can't see much at the moment, except for me really struggling to be able to see here. There you go. So if I just take that and move it out, there's another bit there, so hopefully I can get that sorted later. Might be worth me actually going a bit back in uh, paper on this as well. So I'll just cut a little bit now. Good to see the whole process, I think. Normally I'd have a big table set out so I can do this without too much problem, but I'm probably just going to do it on the floor, actually. The trick now is to stick this onto the top of that without getting air bubbles in it. I'm going to do it really quickly. And I probably will get air bubbles on it. Now, ideally, I'd have a roller now, and I'd be rolling that away uh, so that there's no air bubbles in at all. But it also makes it a lot easier to separate these two things now. Um, I can't actually do it without having plenty of space. And you can't see with me actually working it on the base there. But the idea is that now I should be able to peel the back, leaving the transfer on the... Um, The clear backing paper there. That can now go on the side of a vehicle or on a window. You won't be able to get it off easily, I tell you. So I'm not sure what to put it on here. Let's just put it on a piece of paper for now on the back of my uh, lesson plan. I'm going to place that down, put this on. And again, I have to push down and try and get rid of air and so on. And I would spend a long time probably kind of pushing everything down to make sure it's right. And now what we can do is hopefully it's not working because it's sticking to the back. So I have to be very careful as I'm taking this down that I'm leaving the back on. And also the paper is creasing, which doesn't help. But this could be the side, as I say, it could be on a piece of uh, plastic or wood. It could be on a, a window or the side of a van. So that, as you can see, is doesn't look amazing. Um, for in terms of design, um, it's very accurate. Um, you can go down to text, probably about that kind of size, and I have got, I did have some showed you text um not sure if that's around i'm just going to quick peek no it looks like it's been tidied up but we we do have um examples of um signage around that you can kind of, you can imagine now how easy it is to create stickers um but they are kind of as i say vinyl which is the kind of thing you can put outside you can put on the side of the fan that kind of thing and of course whatever color we've got we load up there we can then put elements of your design from those particular colors. So we can separate text, for instance, from a logo and so on and put different colors together. So uh, that is the vinyl cutter. Um, apologies if it was a bit blue Peter, but I think it's really important sometimes to see a machine and see how the machine works. The thing I'd like to remember when we go and look at RD works and how the laser cutter works was the idea of an origin point, of defining an origin point by moving it and then pressing the button to say, that's where I want you to start. Okay. So now what I want to do, I'm going to share my screen again, and we're going to open up another piece of software, and that software is called Inkscape. 
So I'm just going to share my screen. Entire screen. And share. So hopefully, you will be able to see my screen. And if I open up this page, this is Inkscape. Um, has everybody got Inkscape open, or can anybody open Inkscape, please? Um, if you have any problems, just let us know. I'm going to leave it just a sec. Okay, so has anybody been on the Introduction to Inkscape course that I ran? If so, I apologize if I'm repeating myself at this point. Um, but Inkscape is a really good addition to the tools we've got for 2D um, CAD files and 2D files in general. So I'm just going to go through uh, the basics of this, we'll just explain what it is um, and how it works. Um, I thought Inkscape was a kind of hobbyist thing, um, but what it does really well is it allows us to take photographs and generate um, uh, vectors from it, but also it allows us to, to get this kind of result. I'm just going to check this is correct. That is exactly the same image as that, but this is actually what we call a scan. Uh, with this one, we've taken a, a photograph and we've drawn around that photograph and created lines. The laser cutter has followed those vector lines and engraved. With this one, we've brought in a JPEG and we've basically mapped it. It's called a bitmap. Um, so it's basically working straight from a JPEG. Now, our laser cutter does have the ability to do that, um, but it kind of does a kind of dot to dot 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 kind of thing because as Owen really wonderfully pointed out at the very beginning that there are points and there are lines between those points um, and there are vector lines so if you imagine um, when we do uh, image traces in software such as Illustrator we do tend to get a kind of broken dot to dot line we also seem to get real problems with duplicate lines um, so we've taken a photograph, we've, we've traced it, that then comes into our CAD system, we send it to the machine, the machine cuts and then starts cutting the second one, because the line underneath that we're not aware of. There's all sorts of issues we have, and I found this bit of software, um, Inkscape, solves an awful lot of those problems. So I'm going to start off just by showing a few lines. Um, we'll have a look at the... Um, page that we have in front of us and how to change that. We'll show a few align tools and so on. Um, and I'm just going to turn my tools off on the side here, probably. If I just go to the top there, can I get rid of that? And now I've probably got exactly the same as you guys. Um, the first thing I'd like you to do uh, is to draw a simple shape. But before we do that, notice that my page, I think, normally sets to A4. And if we look at the top here, and we put our cursor, excuse me, on the, um, the left-hand side of our page there, we can see it equates to zero up here. And then we move across to the right-hand page, that equates to 210, which tells us it's 210 millimeters across. And then from the top here, we go across the zero, go down the bottom here, and that equates to 270 odd or whatever an A4 page is. If you want a different size page, which I generally do with laser cutting, I want to change that page to A3, let's say. The way to do that is go right to the top left in File, click on File, and then drop down to Document Properties, which is third from the bottom, and left click on Document Properties. And here we've got a box open there, and we can scroll down from letters and so on, A0, A1, A2, A3, and it's A3 that I want. We've also noticed we've got portrait at the moment. We can change it to landscape. Uh, and once you've set up your page, um, you can just 
I think we just have to close it. We don't have to OK or anything like that. Just close that down. And we'll see now. We've got a landscape piece of paper in front of us now. Starting at zero and go into just over 400. From zero and down. And that will be the 270 odd, whatever, you know, uh, an A3 page is. So that's our page set up. What I want to do now is see, as with, um, uh, with Fusion, we've got these um, particular settings on the right-hand side. I don't want you to change any of these settings up here. Uh, this one over here is enable snapping, just like we had with Fusion. That one there, snap nodes, paths, handles, and so on. Leave it set up the way it is. Um, don't change anything. And I'd like you to draw a rectangle. And the way we do that is we go over to the left-hand side here, and one of the, there's a cursor at the top there, select. The next one is edit paths, and the next one down is rectangle. Left-click on that, and off the page if you want, just draw a rectangle. Now, has anybody got um, a colored rectangle? At the moment because I've set up my if I go back to a cursor I've set up my uh, Inkscape for CAD so I've actually just created lines has anybody got a problem and have that as a colored some do yes some do great okay so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change back to a colored square um, and then show you how to change that and go back to where I am now to set up for something like uh, laser cutting. So I think what I've got to do is I want to highlight that. If I go to object up here, what I'm looking for now is fill and stroke. It's the very first one in objects there. And I should get some uh, tools that have just appeared on the right hand side. Okay. Um, and looking at what we've got now, it's highlighted. So I'm going to go over here where it says fill. I'm going to tick fill. Uh, and now these are my fill tools underneath it. And it says no paint at the moment because I've set it and no paint. If I go to the next one, flat color, okay, and I'm going to change that to blue, which I think a lot of you probably will have. And also, I've got a line, I've got a stroke, uh, and I've actually highlighted my stroke. You might not have that because sometimes it has no stroke. So that when I come to start work, this is the type of thing I get. Let's draw another one underneath. And that should be what a lot of you have got, which is a rectangle. Okay. Um, now, we don't want to have ours colored in, and we don't want to have it um, uh, so that we can't see through it. We just want the outside line. So the idea of stroke and fill are exactly like that. Fill is basically filling in around our outline. Stroke is the outline itself, and we can change the stroke thickness as well. Uh, but we do have to be careful with that, because if you change the stroke thickness, you have all sorts of problems. It doesn't fill in that thickness, um, and it gets confusing. So what I'm going to do now is show you one or two things. This is demonstration only. Um, you can follow me if you wish, but I'm going to do it again if you need me to. Notice my cursor is still at drawing uh, rectangles. So I can go right to the top. And left click on the cursor there, and it's now back to a cursor. So what I want to do here is just show you that we can select one of these, and we can go down to the bottom where all the colors are, and we can select a white. And I'll select off it. But it's disappeared. It's disappeared. I'm going to highlight it again, because we don't have an actual line on the outside. We don't have a stroke. So what I need to do is not have it as white, because that's a color. I could have it as yellow. Um, but what I want to do is remove the fill completely, but bring out the stroke. So where I've got this now, I'm going to go back to white, I think, so we can see it exactly. It's disappeared completely. Or I can draw around it, and it highlights where it is. I'm going to go to the, there's fill. I'm going to go to stroke. And instead of no paint, I'm going to go to the next one, which is flat color and choose black. It can be a dark blue, it can be any color you want, but it has to be dark, really. And now I'm gonna click off, 
and you can see I've got an outline now around my shape. But it's still, I think, a white, isn't it? Let's just double check. Yeah, because we can change the color. So what I want to do now is go to the fill part. Instead of the stroke and paint, which is in now, go to highlight it first, go to fill. And instead of it being color, I'm actually going to hit the no paint, which is the cross, kind of the cross next to it on the top left there of the um, options. And then that fill disappears. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because I can take this now and I can move it. I think if we actually highlight it, you get this little kind of cross when you go near the edge. And we can put that over the top of our um, other one. And it's just the line. Um, and I think we can put this one over that one as well. If we had two fills, let's just do that. Let's put another one over here. And this one we will have as a fill. And we'll also have a different color. But we'll, there you go. So when I actually take this one now and move it over here, you can see the difference. This is a flat sheet of color over another flat sheet of color. Whereas this, hopefully, is a line and just a line which is what we need for laser cutting. So what I'm gonna do now, after that really long and very confusing introduction, is show what happens when we open up at the settings that I think are standard, which is the fill. I do not let me do anything until I've drawn something. Let's just draw something. The fill itself will be a color and it will probably be a darkish blue color, let's say. And the stroke, you go to stroke now, we won't have a color at all. So that's probably what you've got now when we make something, and a circle as well. Let's just make, oh, it's an oval, actually. Um, so what we want to do is we want to change our settings now. So I'm going to highlight it all there. Then I'll go to fill and choose no fill. And I'll go to stroke and I'll choose a dark black and then click off it. And there's my images now, which are, of course, lines that a laser cutter will recognize that we can put over each other. I'm thinking now that once I've set that, the next one I draw should actually be the same, as you can see. So I don't have to go back and take the fill out all the time. What we've got now is a situation where any shape that we make will be the kind of line that will be um, exported to DXF so that the laser cutter will follow. I'm just going to have a look at that stroke once more. Highlight it. And we can see that our stroke here, when we go onto it here, um, I'm just running down to see if we can see where it is. Stroke style, which is next to it, is 0.265 millimeters. Leave it at that. 0.265 is very close to the width of the laser beam anyway. Uh, we can make the stroke thicker, but as I say, it does make problems. So let's just leave that stroke at 0.265. I'm sorry if that was a bit confusing, um, but it's really important we get that right uh, to begin with uh, when we're actually drawing. So I'm going to go back to the cursor there. I don't necessarily need any of these. So I'm, I'm just going to get rid of it now because I'm set up, ready to go. This is my sheet. Um, the other thing that we're going to remember as well is um, how we can navigate. And I've got to remember this now. As I use my uh, wheel on my um, mouse, you see it goes up and down. If I press Control and use the wheel, it zooms in and out. And again, where the cursor is dictates where it zooms to. So we can zoom in and out quite easily using just the wheel and pan up and down, press control and zoom in and out. I think we can right click and pan. I'm still pressing control. If I right click, nothing happens. So, so the controls there, are, they, they change somewhat. There's different ways of doing it. We've always got these kind of bar things at the bottom here where we can scroll 
side to side and up and down as well. But I think the most important one is to press control when we're using the uh, wheel on the on the mouse to zoom in and out. Okay, so let's say we want to draw on here. We're just going to draw some shapes. And we're just going to have a bit of fun with it. Um, I want to show you how this works. So we know already we can draw a rectangle. We can draw a circle. Notice that it's an oval unless we press control at the same time. It becomes a fixed circle. Unless I move up, and it will move in graduate um, points to a, 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 an ellipse. But if we start from the center with pressing control and move out roughly 45 degrees away from it, that will remain as a perfect circle. Okay, so we've got a circle as well. Let's go to the next one. We've got a star. And I've set this star up, actually. So if I actually just take my finger off it, it's still actually within the, the setting of the star. I haven't pressed Enter yet. Can you see um, at the top here, uh, we've got corners, 20. I think I can change that now to 10. And I can hit Enter. And now we've got 10 corners. I've also got these points here, which I think is really good, which we can move. We can slide them. So I can slide that out, but I can also slide it side to side, which is really great when you do this kind of thing. Start making some really kind of freaky uh, patterns. I'm going to take that back in again, and you can see what I mean. We've got a little bit of control to shift that around. And we've also got one here. can't remember what. I think I'll round it and twist it as well. So we've got a little bit of kind of movement on that as well. So lots of things we can do as well. Um, I might actually go back and make some more corners. I'll make that 12. And now I'm back to 12 corners. And notice as well, we've got points at the moment. And we've also got rounded here. I can plus there and keep pressing plus. And they round up ever so slightly uh, to quite a round, splodgy shape there as well. So when we're creating these objects, there are actually editing nodes and things we can do to change it. Um, which are really quite interesting as well. Um, I'm going to make that zero, take that back down to zero, uh, and there it is back to a star. I'm still, notice on my cursor, it's still set up as a star as well. Um, just have to be careful we don't um, run over. Um, let's just draw uh, another thing down here, which is the spiral. I can just left click and draw upwards. There's my spiral. Uh, at the moment, I've got 12 turns, and just like the other one, I can change that to 10 or 8. There's a bit more of a difference there. And there's my spiral with 8. Um, lots of other different things as well. We've got text, we've got lines. I'm going to go to the line, which is obviously the draw freehand line. I'm going to left click and just move. I'm not dragging, I'm just moving my mouse anywhere I like, and then left click again. I've got a straight line. Exactly the same function now, but instead of just moving, I'm going to keep my left click down. I'm going to press my finger down and keep it down and make a line. And I'm going to make a curve. Okay. And this is your typical CAD drawing line. Um, it's, it's, it's really quite common that we get these lines and they're a bit scratchy. I think what I'm going to do now is make myself a bit of space. I'm going to get rid of that line there, delete it, okay? And zoom in on this line here. It's the line that we made by hand. And you can see how bad that is as it was made. Um, I'd like to point out the, the icon right underneath the select icon is edit paths by nodes. I'm going to left click on that and then highlight by line. And it's given me lots of different lines. Remember I said that a vector line is point, another point, and a line between it. So we've got loads of points and loads of lines. I want to soften this line. I want to make it a little bit more fluid. And I can't remember whether it's shift or control. I'm going to try control and L. And can you see it's immediately reduced those lines. Remember when I made that cup, I said, the less lines will give a more fluid line. So I'm going to control an L again. 
and until I'm actually happy with that, control L again. And we've got something that's relatively good. And I think if we select one of these nodes, we've also got this kind of thing here where we can change the nature of a line and how it approaches the node itself as well. So we've got a lot of functionality and we can stretch that up and down uh, to change the way that it actually behaves. So I'm actually gonna put it straight down as a line there. And of course, if I'm not happy, I can control an L once more, which generates a more fluid line again. And this is the kind of thing that I think is really interesting because you can bring a CAD file into um, the laser cutter software and it's forever scratching up and down, which is awful. We can bring it into Inkscape and very, very quickly highlight everything, control an L, and to actually smooth everything out as well. So one more thing I'm going to show you before we show you how to do um, uh, to import a photograph. I'm going to scroll up slightly and I'm going to write some text. Okay, And again, we've got a text box over here, just like we did with um, Fusion. And I'm just going to write my text at the bottom here. And this time I've just left clicked and it started. So I'm going to write my name. Uh, dear, I didn't want to do that. Let's cancel that. Just write my name. Uh, we can make that bold and so on, but what we'll need to do is look at um, a tool to be able to do that. So if you go to the top, we can see we're on sans serif, if that's the right pronunciation, pronunciation, and we've got normal. I'm going to change that to bold, and there it's a little bolder. It's a 56 size. We can make it a bit bigger. Let's make it 60 odd. That's great. So we've got text, and just like um, Fusion, this text won't show up in the software that we're going to take it to if we want to. We need to do the same thing. We need to turn it into something that can be read by a machine. Because it won't be read at the moment. But before I do that, I'm going to place this name onto my line. Can't remember how to do it. So I'm going to go over to select and select the text. And then I'm going to go up to the text tool at the top here. And it says put on path. There fourth one so if I select that and then select the path ah, I think I might have to select the path first so I'm going to stop select the text select the path let's try and see if that works go to text and put on path and there's my name on the path and this is what I love about this I can just hit my space bar let's see if I can actually enter that and just come off it I think I can go to the space there you go and I can move my text up and down. And I can also separate that text and do all sorts within it, um, um, which is really quite easy to do as well. And we do have a film on how to use Inkscape where we go into quite detailed uh, methods of creating um, the signage, you know, with text around and so on. So we've got that we can send to you as well for more information about this. Um, however, at the moment, this won't be um, uh, exported out. So there's something we have to do. We have to go to um, highlight. That's come off it completely. Go to the text itself. We go to path up here. And these first three are vital. The first one is object to path. The second one is stroke to path. And the third one is trace bitmap. Let's go to the top one first, object to path. Even though it's text, if I click on object to path now, like so, this will now be saved as a DXF and go to the laser cutter. Because we've created uh, an object and we've created a path from it, just like we did with um, Fusion. The outline now will now be seen by the laser cutter. The next one in our path here is stroke to path. Remember I said don't change the stroke size? because we can actually change the stroke size to a path and it will cut the outside and the inside. Um, not necessarily a great function to have, but we can actually get our stroke wider. And the final one is trace bitmap of these three. And I'm gonna show you that now. Um, so what I'm gonna do, I think, I wonder if I can, I think it's quite important as well, if we go back to this square, 
and we look at our sizes at the top here, um, it's 78.297 by 69.443. If you wanted to be a perfect square, we could go up here and make that 78. Uh, and then we can go up to the next one, our height, and make that 78 as well. If I click off, this is now a 78 by 78 square. If I highlight it now, there you can see 78 by 78. So we've got the ability to draw accurately, but we can also place it accurately as well. If I go over to my um, ruler over here, left click and drag, you see I'm dragging out a line. And I'll put it near the end there, and I'm going to put it off so we can see that it's not quite right. And I'm going to double click on it. And at the moment, X is minus 8.3. I'm just going to make that zero and enter. And what it's done is it's put that line that I've just dragged out right on the edge of my, um, my page. Um, if I take another one and drag it out, to about there and double click on it and make this one 78. That's placed it exactly 78 apart. And I know that this object here, if I move it and place it, it snaps straight in. It doesn't snap to the top of the page, but it will snap to the lines that we've created very, very easily snaps to there. If I wanted it to snap to the top, I could drag this down to the top, double click on it. It's quite difficult to double click on there and make this one zero. Click OK. And now with this one, I can drag that and it snaps, as you can see, straight into the top there. So what I've done is I've made a square 78 by 78 and popped it right into the corner there. So it is possible now to create very, very technical drawings using this method. I would use Inkscape for something that is um, aesthetic, really, lines, putting text on the line so it looks right. I'd probably use Fusion for something that's really accurate because it is very nuts and bolts, as you, as you saw. But we have a line tools as well. I'm going to show you very, very quickly and easily, I think. I'm going to go to Object up here. And I'm looking for a line, and it's right down the bottom here, the third from the bottom, a line and distribute. If I left click on it, I get more tools that appear over here. And you may have noticed I already had that open, because what I can do is draw myself a few more squares, let's say. Let's do that. Let's draw a square down here, another square up there, and maybe one in the middle there. Okay. So if I select this one and select the second one and I go to my line tools here and it's last selected is relative so let's see what happens when I select here so what it's done is it's moved that one up I'm going to control Z back out again and I'm going to change last selected there to first selected and do the same thing again and select the um, alignment central and there it is placed centrally. I can click this one as well. Click that one centrally and this one as well. Again, I can hit there and hopefully, I think I'll have to do this one first actually and then that one. Align that centrally. I can also align all three of them in lots of different ways. It's just, I'm just pressing uh, shift so I've got them all there. I can align everything to one side, I can line it all to the side with one on top. And again, that's all central down the center there, that's the sides. Um, and from there, there's lots of different ways we can align our objects. Like so. Um, okay, so that's pretty much looking at our objects and making them a little bit more accurate, for instance. Um, I'm not sure I need any of this, so I think what I'll do is just delete a few things. Again, I'm using control to zoom in and out. 
don't necessarily need these either. I think we can highlight those and delete them as well. Okay, what I'm going to do now is bring in a photograph. And this is what Inkscape is best at, okay? And I'm bringing a photograph that I have on my desktop. Um, and I've used it before, and it's actually this photograph. I thought it would be a good idea to show how we make this and how we actually put it together. And then I'll show you how the laser cutter works and the laser cutter actually making these objects. Hopefully, it'll make sense. So all I'm going to do is, from here, go to File. I'm going to open. From the desktop, I think I've got the photograph um, ready to go. And there it is. It's a high-res image, fairly high-res image, actually. It's just called Reptile Eye, and I found it on the internet, basically. It was just an interesting um, photograph. I'm going to click OK. And what I've got now is it's opened a brand new um, uh, file. So I can probably close this one and, and open that one uh, and then make that a bit bigger. And there we have my photograph on the page. It's a little bit bigger than my page itself. So as I scroll out, if I select it, I can probably get it too squashed if I go that way. So I'm going to Control Z, and I'm going to press Control as I bring that in. And it's actually bringing it in in proportion. And I could, yeah, it, it does stay in proportion. So I can move my photograph around now. And there you have it. I chose this because there's a nice graduation from uh, dark to light. It's quite an interesting uh, image as well. If we're not careful, we can choose oranges and browns and greens, and they're all mid-tone, and the laser cutter doesn't understand the difference, and you end up with just a flat burnt sheet, which is what we don't want. So what I'm going to do now is convert this into what we call the bitmap. Um, so if I highlight it, and we go up to path. Do you remember we had object to path, stroke to path, and trace bitmap? I'm going to hit trace bitmap. And we get this um, window that opens up. Nothing happens there. We have to hit update to be able to see it. And there's that photograph. And what it's done, obviously, it turns it into black and white because the laser cutter is not going to recognize the difference between different shades and something. It needs to see it as black and white so that it can create the um, lines for a vector, or it can color in those lines where they're completely enclosed and then give us that. But looking at this, there's too much black. So what we can do is at the moment we're on brightness threshold and there's lots of different kind of thresholds and different ways of changing. I'm gonna leave it at brightness and I'm gonna just hit the, the minus there three or four times. But it's not live. It used to be. The last um, version was live. You saw it change. But I have to hit update to be able to see that lighter. Just do it a few more times until it's a bit too bright, perhaps. That's a little bit too bright. I'm going to bring it back in just a little bit more and then update. And this, to me, is the best way I've found of taking a photograph and converting it um, into something that can be later cut. So... We've done that, hit OK, and now that's done. I can now take my file and save it as DXF. So I'll do exactly that. It's a file, save as. Okay. It's called Reptile Eye. It wants to be a SVG, so I'm going to open that up and look for the DXF. And with Inkscape, it's really important. We've got two DXFs to choose from. One of them is brilliant, one of them is awful. It brings in loads of weird, false information that we don't require. So if you notice, there are two DXFs. That's a bit too small for you to see, I know, but it says Desk Cutting Plotter AutoCAD DXF R12. Avoid R12. The next one down is exactly the same, but R14. It's the R14 version of the DXF that you want. So I'm gonna left click on that, make sure it's going on the desktop, call Reptile Eye, it's a DXF. R14 and hit save and hit that OK. And I'm just going to wait for that to be saved. It takes a bit of time. And there we have it. That should be saved now. So I'm going to go back to uh, my RD works. If you remember, that's the software that comes with our laser cutter. And it's set up for that thing I brought in. And we can change around now. At the moment, I'm going to change these and just have them as cuts. Put 
inputs. Now, if I open this and show what it's going to do, you probably won't be able to see very well, but it's showing me the outline of the text and the outline of the rectangle. So it's going to cut that out completely, but just engrave my name on the, um, on the oblog. I'm just going to close that and change my cut on my text to a scan. So down here where it says cut and process and mode, I'm going to change that to scan, click OK, and then have another peek at what it's going to do. And now it's going to colour in. So I've got the, uh, the option to have the laser cutter to either engrave the line or to actually, where it's enclosed, completely fill that line in. You can see that. Okay. So I'm going to bring in now my um, DXF I've just saved, file and import. And it's the Reptile IDXF. I'm going to open this up. And it's a big file, this actually. Um, and as you can see at the moment, it's a cut. So it's this one. And we can now click peek at that, see what it's going to do. Ah, this is going to take too much time, perhaps. If it does, I might just come straight out of this. I really don't want this to crash. However, um, I'm going to leave it for a second. I could, I think if we exit this, we'll see what it does. There we go. You can't really see it very well. It's very light, but it's actually given us the outline of this, and it's telling me uh, total time. According to this is four hours because my settings are so slow. Yeah, your, yeah, your speed it's is uh, three millimeters. I'm going to change that speed right up to 300, which is really much faster. 300 speed at that. And that then will probably do that 300 times faster. So it'll probably be in 10 minutes or whatever. It can do that kind of job. Um, I could change that to a scam, but a um, little bit concerned that it might crash, as I say. Let's change it to scam. Uh, my scan speed is 300. Uh, the power setting, that's too deep, really. We can set the power set to around about 40, which is what we've got here, I think, at 300 speed and OK. Right, so now when we have a look at that, that's going away, and that will now show us it filled in, which will give us that. Now, the lovely thing about this is, I don't know if you can see this, but you can get depth. And if you can get depth, then we can ink this up and we can print with it. So there's all sorts of things we can do with that process. I'm going to close that down now. And I'm going to show you a few things. We've hit 8 o'clock now, and I've made a film. And it's a really scrappy film. I'm really sorry. Um, but I'm just going to show you this is our software. This is our design. And can you see at the bottom or on the right-hand side here, there's download. I can hit download, and it tells me there's a communication error because I'm not connected to a laser cutter. But if I was, this simply just gets sent to a laser cutter. But then we've got an issue of how do we set the laser cutter up. I'm going to show you that now. So as we just kind of mentioned, and I think Owen spotted it before I did, that I had the speeds and the powers set wrong, what we need to do is decide what speed and power we're going to be traveling on for any particular job. Now, I apologize for the mess. Now, I'm going to go onto my desktop and then pull a few photographs and films out for you. So if I just minimize these and also ourselves. Um, I'm going to go to this image and hopefully you can see this. This is a photograph of different materials. Um, what we've got here is the is plywood um, set as engraves, as cuts. Then we have plywood set as um, scans. So it actually sees the object and cuts away. So these are getting deeper and deeper to the point where this is almost three millimeters deep. Exactly the same thing here on Perspex. So we visually see it getting deeper and deeper. Uh, and again, with Slate, just to show that we can do Slate as well. Not a great photograph, this, unfortunately, um, because it, it didn't quite catch it from the top there. But you can see the idea. This is speed at the top here. So at 100 millimeters a second, which is quite fast, really, at 10%, we'll get that kind of finish. And at 100%, it will cut in three millimeters deep. Um, going a lot faster at 60 at 10%, it doesn't even make a mark. And you can see now what we've got are speeds and power settings that we can choose 
for our particular um, material. So let's say with um, wood that's quite thick, let's say six millimeter wood, we'll have to travel very slowly at quite high power settings. So we'll probably travel at maybe six or seven millimeters a second at maybe, I don't know, 95% power. For paper, we need to be traveling quickly at low power to be able to cut through paper. So I'm not quite sure what that setting will be. So let's say about 100 millimeters a second at say 30 power. That will cut through paper quite safely. What would happen if we cut paper very slowly at high power, of course, is we'll end up with a fire. So we have to be very, very careful. So now I'm going to show you um, the laser cutter itself. I've made a film, as I say, and I'll talk through it. Hopefully you'll be able to see this okay. Oh, sorry, wrong thing. I'm just going to pause it. Can you all see that okay? You there, mate? Yeah, it's great, man. Cool, great. Oh, I can see it. And that is, a, oh, in behind me as well. And this is my terrible attempt. And I'm afraid I've had to hold the camera as I'm doing it, so it's all over the place as well. But basically, this is our 120-watt laser cutter. And what we have to do first is actually put the chiller on because the laser itself is water cooled. So we need to turn this on um, before we even start to think about cutting anything. So water is going through the laser tube, which is glass, cooling it down, and then we turn it on. So the first thing to do, of course, is turn it on on the power and then press start. What happens here is that, remember I said about um, origin points and so on. When you turn a printer on, it whirs around for ages, doesn't it? It makes loads of noise, your standard printer at home. What it's doing is it's moving about and finding where the origin point is. It's basically centering itself. And this is now moving up to the top. It hits a limit switch when it hits there and tells the machine that it's there. Then it moves along to the bottom, to the top corner. I'm sorry, it's just out of focus. Hits a second limit switch. When it does that, it knows exactly where it is in terms of the machine, and it travels back to what was the last origin point of a job. So now we can move that origin point around, just as we did with the, with the vinyl cutter, by pressing the arrows around, it goes up and down, as you see. And then when we're happy with that, we press origin, when we've got it in the right place. So when you press origin, first and then frame which is next to it what it will do then is it will frame where it's about to cut so we can visually see um on the machine itself where it's about to start working so once we've done that that's all well and good then we need to think about focusing remember it said that it sends a beam and it hits a mirror hits another this is one of the mirrors you see at the top there that it hits and then goes down and there's a lens inside there, which needs to be the nozzle 12 millimeters above the material. So the lens in the right place, because the power, or rather the, 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 the beam itself will cross at a certain point and then go out to focus again. So what I'm doing now is that's 12 millimeter piece of perspex, which we take away. We know we're 12 millimeter above, and now we've focused our design, ready to actually cut piece. So before we do that, this is our emergency stop in the event of a fire. And next to that, we have a extraction. And we need to turn that extraction on um, for most materials, but well, basically all materials, actually. Once the extraction's on, that will then take away any fumes um, outside of the building without it having to breathe it in. So that's actually setting up the machine itself. And now I'm going to show you, hopefully, um, the machine cutting. So this is the first but where it's actually going around the, um, the line to produce the vector line. So you can see it just traveling, using the X and Y axis to follow those lines. Uh, and it's moving around line to line, basically. What we do then, I'll close that down, is open up the next one where it's actually scanning. And you can see it's, it's already done the one below. It's traveling from side to side, but going from the bottom up. And when it sees a line, a dark line, it will send a pulse of, um, of power and cut. Where it sees no line, it will remove the power completely. 
And it does have the capability to do grayscale to a certain extent, but we have to choose our image quite carefully, really. Close that up and go to the last one there. Which I think is this one. I hope this will give you a closer view of the, of the finished piece as well. So obviously we can move the laser out the way first, just by pressing upwards, moves away. We can take the material away because we've got a cut on the outside and an engraved. And you can see the difference between the two. That's actually just the vector line. Notice why some of these lines are very scratchy and they burn because it kind of uh, slows down when it comes to corners and then speeds up as well. So it kind of fluctuates slightly. And this, I think, is really exciting. Again, I just showed you a thing, but you can ink this up and you can see the, the depth there, can't you? And you can print with them. I think it's quite a beautiful thing in itself, actually. There we have it. I was going to edit all this together, but unfortunately I ran out of time. So apologies for the separate uh, separate films there. But I do like that kind of work. Right, we've, we've got a bit more time. So I'm going to go back into Inkscape um, and just show one more thing, unless there's any questions, unless you want me to answer any questions. Because we'll stop in about 10 minutes or so and do questions and answers if that's okay. I'm going to get rid of that image. I've noticed that I had to get rid of it twice because one was the JPEG and one was the DXF that I created. Um, and I'm just going to make a quick logo now, um, which could go to the vinyl cutter or it could go to the laser cutter. So I'm going to make a circle and I want that circle to be uh, 120 in size. It doesn't matter where I put it at this point. So I'm going to my circle there and if I have my control on as I make this, and I'm making it any size, really, to start with. And I just moved off control, so it went into a, an oval. So I'm going to control Z. And I'll do that again, just being a little careful this time that I actually finish my circle and then take my finger off control. Um, go to the cursor now, highlight it, and I can look at the size. It's 280. So I want that, as a number, to be 120. It's like a coaster size, isn't it, really? And I'll hit OK. And of course, I only did the one size. So, control Z back out and notice that there is a padlock between the width and the height. So, I'm going to hit that padlock and now change that to 120. It'll do both. Now we have a circle of 120. This is fast, I know, and it's more of a demo. And we also have this on the introduction to Inkscape in far more detail. So, if you are interested in this, then we've got that backup film as well we can send to you. So don't worry if you can't follow this bit. Um, I'm going to produce an offset line from the line on the outside. Um, I can't quite remember how to do it, so I'm going to go to the line itself, go to Object, and I'll probably find it somewhere. If it's not in there, it'll be in Path. And there it is, Linked Offset. So I'm going to select linked offset and I get a dot there at the top and I want to zoom in just a little bit before I start and I'll grab that dot and pull in and I've got an offset line now and I'm going to actually put some text around that line I think but I'm also going to use it within a line tool to put my logo in the center of my photograph so I've got to bring in a logo now um, I wonder if I should do the text first let's do the text first shall we and I'm just going to do Smart Citizens uh, program. Let's just put Smart Citizens on there. So I'm going to go to my text over here. And I can put it anywhere, my text, really. I'll write Smart. And it's huge. I apologize for my spelling if I got it wrong. I'm going to go really small there with my text. That's a 24, and then zoom out and see if I can see where that is. There it is. Still a bit big, isn't it? So let's go now from 24 down to 16, and then a little bit further, about 12. How's that? And we'll make it bold. I like the bold. Well, I want to put this on this line. I'm not quite sure how it's going to work. Um, so well, we know it's going to work. We did the line earlier, so I'm going to select it. 
and select the line as well. Okay, and now I'm gonna go to path or text, sorry, and I'm gonna put on path. And there it is, smart citizens on the path. And as luck would have it, it is correct. It can move up and down and so on. Um, I could put it on the other side of it as well. I'm actually thinking about it and put it on the top. It might be even better. So I need to know how to do that. I'm going to click off everything. And what we need to do is flip this smart citizens on this line. And it took me ages to figure this out. It really did. Because I was there just clicking away for ages. So let's see if I can remember how to do it. It's either the line we select and we go flip. And there is up here somewhere flip selected objects vertically and hit that and see straight away smart citizens has appeared on the outside i can't tell you how long it took me to figure that out i was flipping the text and it doesn't work that way you select the line you flip that line on itself it takes the text with it really weird right i'm going to show you something now and that's how we can move the smart citizens to the top if I just go to um, highlight the letters, let's do that now. We've highlighted it. Notice we've got the ability to make it bigger and stretch it. If we had it at a second time, so I'm going to click it twice. One, two. That didn't work. Let's do that again. Highlight it and then highlight the box again. See if I can get this. Apologies for this. Highlight it. Second time. Ah, it's done it. Finally, I can rotate it. These things are slightly different now. They've actually given me the rotation. But notice the dot here. It will rotate around the center of it. So what you can very sneakily do, especially if you have a little dot in the beginning of your design, is just drag that dot to the center of our design. So that when we rotate now, we rotate around the center. Now, I haven't got it exact, but I could have put a dot at the beginning, couldn't I? And it's disappeared completely there, so I'm just going to control Z out of that and see why that was the case. We do little bits at a time so it doesn't disappear. And there we have Smart Citizens. It's only because the dot wasn't perfectly central, but of course we can drag it and move it to our heart's desire, and then we can move it around. So really, have I spelled that right, by the way? Tell me if I haven't, because being dyslexic is really embarrassing. <laughs> Looks fine, mate. Okay, well, that's all I'm going to use for now. We can put other text on there, but the problem is now, if I um, bring other text in, everything goes do lally. So what we've got to do is take that text, which isn't a vector yet, and then go up to uh, path and go object to path. Now that's fixed. We can get rid of the line if we want to and just leave the text without actually doing that. If I'd have got rid of the line before I did that, the text disappears as well. So what I'm going to do now is bring in our logo. and I've got it on the desktop, so I'm going to open. And I think it probably will come in or import might be better. Let's see what happens. Uh, from the desktop, let's see if we can find our logo. And there it is, Smart Citizens logo. We'll open that now, click OK, and there it is, absolutely huge. So I'm going to control down, move it to one side, and basically just control and drag down. Now we know we've got some quite clever um, uh, tools, haven't we, um, on here for, just make it a bit closer, for alignment tools. We've still got them open over here. So let's see what happens. I think it's a bit too big still. So I'm just going to make that a little bit smaller. And I want to put that central to here. So if I select my line first, um, I'm not sure if that's a correct one. Let's select the outside line. Then I'll select the logo. And then we'll just check to see what happens when we come to align it up. And then align it across. And there it is in the center of our text. However, you can see that we've got the um, kind of uh, corners there. It's a visual thing that because at the moment we know that this is a JPEG and we need to do the same thing we did with the reptile eye. We need to turn it into a vector. 
So we're going to go up to path. We're going to go to trace bitmap. And there it is. We can make it a little darker. Like that. I'm happy with that. Click OK. So now we know that that will be exported out, but it's still visually not very pleasant. And you might want to see the whole thing. So I just want to point out um, if we highlight it and then we go and look at the little logos on the top. One of the really good things here is there are four logos together. One here, which says lower selection to the bottom and one which is raise it to the top. So I want to take this selection, lower it to the bottom like so. And it hasn't worked. Yes, it has. I don't know why it didn't work the first time, but there you go. So what we've got now is our uh, design, which we can send to the laser cutter. Um, let's do just that, shall we? Hopefully the text and the logo and these lines will all be able to go to the laser cutter. So um, we can just go up now to file and we can go to save. And it's lagging kind of big time. Apologies for this. I really hope it doesn't crash at the last minute. Ah, let's go to save as this time. So may well have already saved it. If you remember, I kind of went back and then overwrote it. So it's already been saved. That's why that's my daftness, the bit pilot error. So I'm going to save that as uh, uh, it's SCP logo. I'm going to save it as a DXF 14, R14, remember, rather than R12, onto the desktop and save. Click OK. Hopefully now we can open either our laser cutter software or indeed our vinyl cutter software. And we'll import now our logo open that up and there it is with different colors already but of course i want the outside to be cut so i'm going to select the outside line make that red the inside can stay as pink and i can choose to to take that out or not uh the black was going to be a scan so it's all kind of filled in so at the moment let's just have a quick peek at it and there's our design, a bit more text at the bottom would kind of round that up nicely. And we've got that line as well that Smart Citizens is in. I think I'll probably take that out. So I'll just go out now and I can either delete it or just say that no output on that. Have another peek at it. And there it is ready to go. Have you noticed, by the way, a green dot down here? Close out so we can see it. This dot here is the origin point I was talking about. Remember in the film when it can return to an origin point, we moved it around um, using the arrows to the point where we defined where that origin point was gonna be on our material. And once we did that, we hit a frame and it would go around and show where it was gonna be cut. And that's all there is to it. That's ready to go to the laser cutter now. Hit download and save and send. So um, that's kind of everything I wanted to cover within I think we've got about five, seven minutes left or something like that. So I do hope I haven't rushed through too much. There's an awful lot to see, but um, there's an awful lot of similarities as well. I don't know if you've noticed, but the Align tools were in probably in Fusion as well. Um, but there were certain things that were kind of similar. Um, but as I say, I would use Inkscape for uh, photographs and and almost like uh, more fluid, um, we can bring any image in as well. So that I've done a lot of work with, work with um, uh, open source imagery. We've got to be very careful when we use open source imagery that um, we don't infringe anybody's copyright. So when you actually download something open source, you've got to check not just that you can download it for free, but that you can use it that it's actually um, uh, free to use. And certainly if you make money from things, you certainly credit the original author or change it to the extent where it's unrecognizable perhaps.
So I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, come back here. And that completes um, session three. So if there aren't any questions, um, just to say that Owen is taking the next session. So Owen, do you want to just explain what you're going to be covering in session four? Yeah, absolutely. So next next week, um, it's going to be basically a session of two parts. And uh, the initial part, first part, will we'll continue to look at Fusion 360. We're going to be looking at things like um, how we can copy stuff, how we can move it, how we can project and derive um, um, objects within the file itself. We're going to also be looking at components, how to create components and what it what it means. Um, once the fusion bit is out of the way, which is probably about half the session, if not less, we're going to look at 3D printing. Now, Ian covered 3D printing or FDM printing, fused deposition modeling, last week. So we're going to look at that a little bit briefly, but we're going to focus on two other types of printing. One's called selective laser sintering. And the other one is called stereolithography. And that's the one we're mainly going to be focusing upon and how you create files for that uh, kind of printing technique. So I'll be doing a uh, live demonstration of that in the lab as well. I think that's about it. Brilliant. Uh, someone wants to know where the hell am I? Is it a secret channel? <laughs> it's a catacombs. <laughs> uh, this is Clark and Will Prison, uh, our old prison in London. Um, which uh, used to be open to the public. This, it looks a little damp. It is very damp. It's Well, I do live in a basement, but um, I don't live here, obviously. <laughs> um, yes. So um, for, for next week, you're going to need uh, very fitting. That's when Ian had long hair. Um, <laughs> so next week, we're going to be using, uh, obviously, Fusion 360, but we're going to be using a bit of software called Preform which hopefully you've got uh, you've got uh, that downloaded 